Hi, my name's Ben Beaton, and I'm here with Ben Price. I'm an artist, and many years ago, I did an artist residency project at Alice Springs Desert Park back in 2016, which is when I met Ben Price. He was a tour guide, and he was a wealth of information about everything in relation to Central Australia's geology, the deep time history, and accessing these amazing stories through the landscapes, through the walks that he took me on. Later on, as time flowed by, I started to work on the Gene Stream Sculptures project and I asked scientific illustrator Marley Moyer to work with me on the art for that project. So what you're looking at today is the field naturalist artwork which is informed initially by my time at Alice Springs Desert Park and then revisited and built into further with a huge amount more of detail that I worked on with Marley Moyer. And Ben is joining me today to discuss some of the geological details that are within the artwork. So welcome, Ben. Hello, Ben. Good to be here. Good to be working with you yet again on another fascinating project. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the previous two projects that we did uh, at Alice Springs and at Uluru Karajuta have been fascinating and I'm uh, looking forward to um, navigating through this particular project. Uh, this too looks absolutely uh, intriguing. Mm, not to mention our um, more recent project at Wave Rock as well. Yes, that one too. That was uh, an incredible um, project as well, incredibly colourful well, and extremely well received by the um, the local people and, uh, uh, and, and just the, the visitors uh, who come through. So today, looking at the full artwork, this is the internal artwork when you enter the Gene Streams sculpture. In this case, it's an augmented reality sculpture at um, Alice Springs in the Todd Street Mall. This is what you see, all of these details. This, the, what I was trying to do um, in, in the early stages of the development of this is I was so overwhelmed by there were so many different stories and landscapes and features, how to put all of that into one artwork. So I adopted an approach that was a little bit like uh, the cubist approach when you're looking at, say, um, whatever the topic is, you're looking at it from many different angles and then embedding all of those perspectives and angles into the one artwork. So quite early in, in the process, and I was with Ben and others, uh, just so overwhelmed, I thought the only way to try to deal with this is to approach this as sort of a, a cubist approach to landscape. And so that's some of the things that we're going to look at today. So let's say... Do, do you want to say a few words, Ben, just looking at the whole artwork before we move into the details? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, the, the artwork there, uh, just looking at it, is, um, again, just uh, full of details. Uh, it's a classic piece of um, Ben Beaton work, uh, incredible details. You could be uh, there for hours um, uh, embedding yourself and uh, um, navigating through all the incredible details and the stories. Um, uh, it, so, sort of initially it looks um, uh, semi-chaotic, but then when you look um, deeper, uh, yeah, there's clearly um, uh, a rhythm, a structure, um, um, uh, you know, uh, an order through it. I can see that um, uh, you've got the supercontinent cycle uh, at the top, the stars, um, and then uh, as you go down, um, you've got um, the landscapes and the animals and, um, and then and basically the uh, the geology the, the earth that underpins everything comes um, so um, that uh, incredible concept um, uh, that we have um, uh, as above so below uh, um, uh, is very much a part of that um, that that brilliant piece of um, artwork incredibly colorful as well I, I just love it the thing about it was the whole project was really heightened when I asked scientific illustrator Marley Moyer to start to work on these with me. Marley's one of Australia's greatest scientific illustrators. And so to have the opportunity to work with an artist of that caliber with all of these details of the species that you can see in here really heightened the whole thing. It just takes it all up to this next level of um, really seeing the details within the landscape. Uh, I'm more given to the, the macrocosm, uh, whereas Marley is a specialist in 
pulling and zooming into the microcosm details within the landscape. So it's a great balance between the two. But what you're saying as above, so below, uh, you're quite right. You can see that unusual wave shape at, at the bottom of this. I mean, Ben would uh, often talk to me about the fluidity of geology and so too referencing that with the flow, but also um, that fluid wave type shape at, at the base of it uh, is referencing the multiple times in which the sea has come into Central Australia in its deep time history, both Cambrian or Devisian times and then more recently uh, in Cretaceous times as, as well. So there's a, a, an interplay between all of these facets of access points that the current landscape takes us into in exploring the deep time history and heritage of the region. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, in reference to uh, Mali Moya and her, her uh, contribution to the artwork, I mean, uh, it, it's a testimony to her talent, her skill, her experience, um, but just um, um, her way of seeing uh, things with incredible uh, detailed uh, um, and veracity. So it is um, uh, almost uh, photographic like, um, but it isn't. That's the thing. Um, it's that um, uh, that deep dive into a particular um, uh, element of nature and to sort of understand the details and how it all um, comes together, how it's arranged and then um, then captured two-dimensionally on a piece of paper. Um, and, uh, and that um, is probably uh, about 10,000 times better than any photograph uh, if you were able to sort of render that um, detail. That is a measure of how well you understand um, that particular element um, in the environment. So uh, that that's uh, an incredible skill and, and, and I think provides a, an excellent example of those people sort of moving into these areas to slow down, look deeply into uh, the landscape um, right down to the uh, microscopic uh, level and, and, and study and spend time um, uh, making those connections uh, to, to, to that degree, um, uh, which is, I think, uh, uh, probably one of the best ways to connect um, with with nature really and in reference to the um, to the flowing um, uh, line down at the bottom there the the sea coming in and out and so yes uh, geology uh, understanding deep time uh, in geology fluidizes um, rocks it turns uh, nouns into verbs it basically um, uh, makes the uh, landscape um, dynamic um, it's kind of like um, um, a time machine you're zipping back and you can see that landscape changing and and it basically gives you um, a better understanding of where you're at because you understand um, what um, the story um, has gone before and give you a, a deeper appreciation of um, uh, the landscape around you and and certainly going forward uh, sort of uh, gives you the appreciation of how precious this landscape is and how in to some degree uh, uncertain the future is and and um, you know, the responsibility that we have going forward to sort of make sure that things um, flow and um, uh, basically yeah, um, come together the way it's supposed to be, yeah, um, as it has done in the past, and, um, and to sort of um, uh, cherish that. Absolutely. And in relation to moving forward at this stage, can we move on to the second slide, which is the actual map that... Um, I remember looking at with you long time ago of the region. As you say, it's a very, very special place. What can you, can you tell us initially about looking at this map to orientate people um, about this amazing landscape? So that's in re reference to the um, uh, Western Macdonald National Park map um, that we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah, so um, that is... Um, uh, that basically gives you, um, in a nutshell, what um, this incredible place is about, this ancient um, mountain range, basically the, the, the roots of what would have been quite um, uh, substantial mountains right across central Australia, um, beginning its formation with the Alice Springs orogeny. 
about 450 million years ago. So this is just the bones um, of those mountains that um, uh, were thrown up um, during the uh, um, the formation of Pangaea, Gondwana, um, and uh, created the, um, uh, the the landscape that we see. And then subsequently, over the last 300 million years, um, the erosion that's taken place, and then we're just seeing the um, just the, the shadow of what used to be something incredible. So, uh, in uh, looking at this map, you can see all the different places that you can visit. Um, um, heading out from Alice Springs all the way out to uh, uh, and out to uh, Mount Sonder and beyond, out to even. Um, uh, probably um, the more interesting, most recent event, um, and that's uh, um, Nura, uh, Nura uh, Comet Crater or uh, Goss's Bluff, which is when we say recent, um, you know, we're talking about only 142 million years ago. But that, that's probably the most recent um, addition to the the suite of um, incredible sites that we have from Alice Springs right out. Um, uh, west to the to the crater past Mount Sonder. Mount Sonder itself is probably one of the most iconic places um, in the McDonnell Ranges, um, and uh, its story and how uh, essentially it's um, kind of almost upside down um, gives you some sense of the power of the um, uh, behind uh, um, the mountain building forces that created this um, place. So uh, what we're seeing there is is basically um, the 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 wreckage um, of, of mountains um, being built and then uh, torn down by time and uh, the elements and um, and just uh, laid bare for everybody to, to see the power of the earth, really. Yeah, stunning. Just absolutely incredible. And when, when you think about the scaffolding to all of this, the deep time lineages that connect all of these amazing places together through this mighty mountain range building type of process. It, it really is mind blowing. But if we move on to that next slide, we're just looking at one of these little details within the whole picture. This is, um, it's loaded full of detail, of course. You can see a lot of elements within it. But uh, I remember you talking to me a long time ago about the McDonald's and how they'd been hollowed out through deep time. Um, so what can you tell us about you know, when you drive into Alice Springs, you think, okay, well, that's a road and it's going in through these mountain ranges, but it's a lot more than that, isn't it? Yes, it is. I mean, so just imagine you're flying into Alice Springs Airport. You first get um, a glimpse of the uh, the antiquity um, of the mountains as you come in, flying perhaps over the range, um, uh, but also the um, surrounding floodplains, um, uh, skirting off the actual ranges and when you, you finally sort of make your, your approach you might get a, a glimpse of um, heavy tree gap um, that is the gateway into, into Alice Springs itself and then when you get off the plane and then start to move in you or, or that sense of antiquity is only enhanced um, uh, as you, you move through the landscape and eventually as you approach Alice Springs and through heavy tree gap you can see um, the Western McDonnell Ranges um, uh, you know heading out west on your left hand side and east on your right hand side and you can see um, the, the the vestiges of well, the first thing that you see is the heavy tree quartz site um, uh, that is the the start of the uh, Amadeus Basin uh, and essentially that is um, the beginning of um, uh, everything that you see through the McDonald Ranges um, and that's basically the start of everything the uh, Rodinia the uh, uh, the supercontinent before Pangaea um, that was uh, occurred over a billion years ago so you're met by a billion years of history um, um, and 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 then that basically vindicates uh, your sense that you're entering into something that's incredibly old and 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 the only way to understand that is through the lens of deep time and then in Alice Springs itself um, um, uh, is underpinned by geology, older still 1.7 billion years, um, and, and you have to go back another supercontinent cycle. So this whole landscape is is forged by um, three supercontinents, um, uh, Pangaea, uh, Rodinia, and then back to Nuna, 1.7 billion years, uh, um, and, and, and this 
tells you if you need to if you want to create a landscape like this you need three supercontinents and at least 1.7 billion years yeah i remember you saying to me much of what geology is about is about the splendor of recycling old material and expressing it in new forms and you know so too with this detail you can see elements uh, that are actually from former residencies former artworks but when you're dealing with the macrocosm they still apply as you move through place to place, like complete artworks in one place become a small detail in another place. And actually, if, if you look through the gap there, you can just make out uh, a diagram of Uluru and Katadijuta in the far distance, as if you'd spliced through the earth. And, and that was actually, uh, when I put that detail in, I was thinking about the next residency, which was coming up at Uluru after my time at Alice Springs and wondering what was going to happen out there and of course that became the unearthing Uluru story uh, that we explored next but we if we move on to the next slide we get a, a pretty pretty rough sketch um, now I remember doing this one and being utterly blown away and thinking I have to do this as a huge artwork at some point but I've just I've got to do do this this justice. The initial sketch, trying to get my head around um, what you were talking about, and so I guess this is actually in the artwork. It's it's a buried. It's a small detail. If you were looking at the web page, you'd never make it out. So I thought I should bring it up because, as as I recall, just to try to encapsulate in an, in a nutshell, epic amounts of, of deep time here. Uh, you were talking to me about Australia moving across the equator, going back Cambrian times, uh, and uh, you know, prior to that, and and then you, you. So, in my head, this is what I was thinking when I was sketching this out. So we've got the, the Peterman Mountain Range that that rises up, and that's the, the height of the Himalayas, and and then that that material is eroding away, and it eventually forms Uluru and Katadijuta. Uh, and, and then, but you, you've got a second mountain range that not that long, comparably in terms of deep time, is rising up and it's rising up through the Larapinda Seaway and that's the McDonald Ranges. So you've got these parallel mountain ranges in Central Australia, but the big but is that the East Coast doesn't exist at this time and Australia back then is twisted very loosely or so, approximately 90 degrees counterclockwise. So these two mountain ranges, parallel type mountain ranges, the other one, the height of the Rockies or so, uh, are facing uh, north-south. And so Australia crosses the equator, comes down, goes all the way down to the South Pole. And then here we are back at the present day. And now that mountain range, Australia's all pivoted around 90 degrees. The east coast has been formed. And so here we have these mountain ranges today. But as I do this, I'm holding up my hands parallel, facing north-south and slowly twisting them uh, and following down, going all the way down south and back up. And then and then, and here they are, the, the remnants of the two still parallel, facing approximately east-west. That, 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 that was mind-blowing to think about that story of these twin mountain ranges. And as they erode down, they pivot 90 degrees going down to the South Pole and then back up from the equator. That's just amazing. Yeah, that's what um, geology does. It gives you that perspective. Uh, um, it, it turns something that, you know, uh, when you see it, you're only just seeing just a single um, frame in an incredibly long movie. Um, and if you were to just stare at that frame and not ask questions about it, going, well, what are you, what, what's your story? Uh, you'll see that um, uh, through deep time and geology, uh, um, that there's a much uh, longer film, many more frames to to look at, and then when you um, string them together and look at them as they as like a movie, you can see um, that it is incredibly dynamic. The only um, problem of us being trapped in in this sort of time with 70, 80 years is that we don't get to see it um, uh, um, actually happening uh, on the kind of scars that you're describing there. We, we, we have to use our our intelligence and uh, our imagination to be able to sort of, uh, um, and our science of course, to be able to um, uh, close our eyes and, and uh, watch um, uh, uh, that unfolding of of um uh of geology over 
big time moving around. For me, I, probably the best way to, um, to describe that, um, when I first sort of encountered this idea and I was trying to uh, look for an analogy was uh, um, I imagined as a kid, uh, um, one of my favourite things was to um, go into dodging cars um, and then I was looking at quite dodging cars swinging around, going around, uh, um, crashing into each other. I was thinking, well, just imagine if those um, dodging cars were made of foil um, and you crash into um, a another uh, dodging car also made of foil and and the the, the crumpling um, is is remembered and uh, and at the end of maybe 10 15 minutes of dodging car you look at your own car and you, you'd see that um, uh, what has happened to it the crumpling the tearing away um, and that kind of gives you a sense of uh, what um, uh, deep time geology in particular in reference to the supercontinent cycle with the building of mountains and the tearing them down um, actually uh, occurs. So the Peterman Ranges um, and uh, the McDonnell Ranges uh, it essentially takes two orogenies to make something like um, Uluru, Karajuta um, and uh, in reference to what you were saying before, um, the Earth uh, loves to recycle and cycle. So so cycling uh, um, through, uh, like the supercontinent cycle, it is a cycle. It's like one of the, the longest, most majestic um, cycles the planet um, uh, has ever, you know, sort of embraced. It takes maybe two or three galactic um, years to get through a supercontinent cycle, a galactic year being sort of 250 million years, uh, um, the, the same period of time that Earth um, takes or our solar system takes to go around the, the Milky Way galaxy. So we're looking at anywhere between 500 and 750 years to get through a supercontinent um, cycle. Um, and then uh, but when when supercontinents um, build, uh, um, they create mountains. When they uh, come apart, they create um, uh, lots of continents and continental shelves, sediment erosion, it changes the climate. Uh, um, and so this is very much a part of it's a very dynamic planet that we we live on there is nothing like um earth anywhere in the solar system um uh, with its uh, constant um recycling and cycling um and it makes these extraordinary um geological formations like uluru Karajuka, and the mountain ranges themselves um onto themselves are extraordinary um uh, manifestations of Earth ceaseless moving around. Uh, it's just something uh, uh, to behold and 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 very, very incredibly exciting that you can sort of take, um, close your eyes and go in your own little um, time machine in your in your mind and navigate through that and see how dynamic is it is and what uh, the kinds of things that it throws up, not just rocks but life. It's very much like going through a wormhole and I, I kind of literally mean that I mean I remember being out in the East McDonald's with a geologist and there was uh, a, these holes in the rock and, and then these little wiggly bits of rock coming down that were like uh, and I was like what, what are they and he said they're, they're actually uh, the homes of Cambrian worms they were marine yes. worms and yep. and so here I was like looking at at these homes of these marine animals that were existing at the time when the first eyes were evolving and the first life forms were actually beholding the world in this fuzzy sort of way. Um, and I, I was just blown away that the rocks would hold that memory of home from that long ago. Uh, so it is a wonderment, uh, but moving on, if we move on to the next slide, a major feature, Ben, this was, this was, this was big. So can you tell us what, what we're looking at here? This is part of this approach of the, the cubist approach to, to the different narratives and stories and perspectives of landscape. But we are looking at a kind of major feature here, aren't we? We are, yeah. So that's in reference to a neural uh, Goss's Bluff. Yeah, you can see it right up in the top right the top corner. Right. Yes. And then and if we follow it down, we've, we've got some got... rivers. Yep, that's it. Um, so we're looking at, um, uh, well, uh, well, let's have a look at um, uh, Goss's Bluff. That's the most striking uh, um, uh, element that has drawn my eye in this particular slide. Uh, Goss's Bluff um, 
uh, is the, the western extreme of uh, the National Park, about 180, 70 kilometres west of Alice Springs through the McDonald Ranges. Um, and that yellow can... line, I'll just say the yellow line you can see in the top right corner is meant to reference the actual asteroid impact. That's the, the, the idea. Yeah. is that the, and, and, it, and it looks, doesn't it, like uh, it's sort of that, that strange curve that goes around Goss's Bluff is all part of the same formation event, but it was just by chance it happened to hit there, isn't it? It is, yeah, that's it. I mean, so that's um, embedded um, within the James Range, just south of the Western McDonald Ranges, um, um, out um, uh, where it starts to become uh, flatter, less mountainous. Um, There's quite extraordinary um, um, hills um, out there. I mean, these beautiful curves that you have there are... um, uh, represent um, uh, the aerial view of the James Range, um, and they are basically the um, the rims of the the anticlines, the synclines of the, of the mountains, um, particularly out that part of um, uh, Central Australia, west of Alice Springs. And uh, if you could just imagine just um, 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 a mountain forming, and then if you were to slice it through at the base, and then you'll see the um, uh, the uh, the tree rings, if you like, um, of these um, mountains, um, and uh, they form these distinct um, ridges that uh, depict the different um, geologies that were laid over um, between the supercontinents, um, Rodinia and uh, Pangaea. All of those layers were laid down, as you were saying, um, in the Lara Pinta Seaway um, just before the Western McDonald Ranges um, came up. But um, what kind of really sort of um, added the finale uh, for that particular area Area, which I, I, as you say, um, it's sort of serendipitous that it sort of picked this beautiful uh, central part of the uh, ranges to, to hit um, the earth there is Nurala or Gosset's Bluff, um, uh, which struck the earth about 142 and a half million years ago. Um, probably uh, most likely a comet that um, created this extensive crater. Uh, and, and if, and and if you look and listen to the um, local stories, um, they echo pretty much um, the reality of the formation of the place itself. Um, and it's certainly worth um, spending some time there in the crater. Um, and uh, and just reminding you that uh, everything on Earth has fallen from the sky. And this is just a reminder um, uh, that um, these events um to, to a large degree, has created uh, what we have here on Earth mm-hmm. um, and, and continues to um, uh, dictate terms to, to Earth in terms of how it um, evolves and um, plays out its existence in the cosmos. So um, it's certainly a, a credible place there, but embedded um, in those um, beautiful long uh, lines, uh, you've got the um, the Fink River, which in itself uh, um, uh, is quite extraordinary um, part of the landscape, uh, one of the oldest uh, rivers in Australia, if not the world, um, uh, that um, starts around the McDonald Ranges and then meanders through these um, ancient mountains, creating the gaps, the gorges um, throughout um, central Australia, that part just west, particularly west of or just south of um, Hermansburg and then makes its way all the way down to, to Lake Eyre. But going down the river, you're, you're, you're immersed in these um, ancient um uh, mountains in the gorges and and it cuts through deep time and then you get a um an insight into uh, how this place has has formed um and also just the uh the the kind of water that would have or had to have um, come through to create these um places um over deep time the volume and the extensive um, time uh, and the activity again sort of uh, um uh, sort of permeates your soul and then and, and garners this incredible respect for this place, um, which you sort of uh, sort of can extend um, to 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 the earth, uh, um, uh, you know, as a, as a result. So you sort of grow um, uh, in maturity and your outlook um, uh, uh, towards our incredible planet that's been able to sort of um, give us um, our, this incredible place that we live in. It's it's totally extraordinary. And look, if we move on to this next slide, I'd like to share with the audience this really unusual shape that to me is one of the most profound things in this whole artwork. I mean, the whole artwork is just a embodiment of the profound uh, 
experiences um, that Central Australia and Alice Springs region offers, of course. But this particular strange coloration, you can see this, this pink color and the yellow color, and then there's that orange blob bit, <laughs> and then there's that little red blob bit. Um, in, in answer to the, any query about what that, that is, it, it actually comes from a, a paleo map from the Ordovician times. And that, that pink color references the actual sea of the Ordovician. That's the, as, as the sea comes through into the Larapinta Seaway, that's actually what, what that represents. It actually represents the sea when Australia was um, pivoted 90 degrees counterclockwise to what it is now and was crossing the equator. And that orange circle uh, is marking out approximately where Alice Springs is today. And that little red dot within the orange dot is, is referencing the Alice Springs Desert Park, approximately where that is. So the idea that the McDonald Ranges rise out of this, and at the time, of course, there's, I wouldn't say no life on land. I mean, Silurian is obviously known as that period in which plants come onto land, but in more recent times, new evidence has been found of plant life in the Ordovician coming onto land, uh, not to mention the incredible diversity that was already in the ocean, such as the ornithocone. I mean, at this time, you didn't have trees, but you, the ornithocone, that's about the size of a semi-trailer truck. It's a cephalopod, a humongous animal. So it could have well been in here in this Larapinta Seaway with the McDonald Ranges rising up through the water. Um, and to me, that's, that's, that's an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. And just, just over to it, we can see one of these... Uh, Cambrian uh, trilobites that actually even predates this. A number of the, the species illustrated by Marley Moyer, the uh, present expressions of the gene streams. Um, but it's just an incredible thing to, re to reflect on how uh, deep time, it, 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 one of the most amazing things is, is you know, that the story of deep time and geology, it's, it's one of the most abstract things. If you're, if you're an artist that's interested in abstraction in some form, uh, you can't go wrong if you enter into the world of geology. Yes, that's it. I mean, uh, um, the, it was probably one of the most important uh, periods in the Amadeus Basin, uh, which stretches right across Central Australia and including um, Alice Springs, uh, which basically ended with the rising of the McDonnell Ranges. And the Lara Pinta Sea is kind of punctuates the midway point uh, roughly between um, the breakup of Rodinia and uh, the um, the rising up of the McDonnell Ranges um, and the coming together of Pangaea. So uh, that, that period... Um, was incredibly important, not only because Australia was um, passing across um, the equator into the summer, uh, southern hemisphere and becoming the land down under. Most of its existence, um, it was it spent uh, up in the northern hemisphere um, under construction before it sort of um, headed down south, uh, mostly constructed uh, um, uh, and heading into into the period of um, of. Pangaea, but that seaway was in a way um, instrumental for many uh, uh, features that you find throughout Australia. I mean, the um, the sedimentation that um, is required to sort of lithify the um, the material that makes up Uluru and Karajuta was laid down during the, the that time of the Ordovician and the Lara Pinta Sea, um, and that compression or those successive um, layers. Um, um, essentially cooked um, the, uh, the sediments of Uluru and Karajuta. But also um, uh, y y a lot of the features that you find around uh, um, uh, Central Australia and particularly in the McDonald Ranges and particularly along places like uh, Ellery Creek and um, in the James Range, uh, you, you see as a result of the Lara Pinta um, Sea, but also um, uh, one of the oldest um, fish, the Arundapis, um, uh, the fossil which you can find um, uh, is related to um, the existence of the Lara Pinta Sea, which would have um, uh, moved uh, basically straddled right across um, 
Central Australia. So um, uh, an absolutely uh, um, key point that you've captured in that particular um, uh, depiction there. Well done, Ben. Well, thank you. In, in fact, it connects to the next slide. If we move along to the next slide, you can see at the bottom there's a wave, a, a reference to one of these wonderful waves crashing against the McDonald Ranges as they rise up through the seaway. You can see a very small little detail of an ornithocone in there. And then we have something that seems totally irrelevant or not irrelevant, but it's connected in a way, but not directly. Some little sketches of Marla and Hopping Mouse. But then uh, on the right hand side, this is, uh, I do remember this pivotal moment of um, when we met. I've been working on this sketch of the supercontinent cycle. And I remember saying, what are you working on? And you said, oh, what are you working on? And then we both realized we were working on the supercontinent cycle because I'd been trying to do this drawing. Uh, you know, and you think about the tree of life, there's a tree of rock as well. And, and, and the connection between the tree of rock and the tree of life and, and how to visualize that and think about that. Uh, and you um, were doing a huge amount of research in reworking the, the model of the uh, supercontinent cycle and, and thinking about that in four dimensions. So we're both thinking about it in, in this four dimensional mapping approach. Um, and Simon Johnston, I believe, had done a huge amount of work on this. And so, uh, and then later on, of course, we animated it. But this, this sketch was sort of the one, I remember um, sitting around with you and you were recording a bunch of films that are actually feature on this page of Central Australia. And I was continuing on with this fluid drawing. And then here it is in the artwork. And it, it really does apply to all of the sculptures. I, I try to put it into every sculpture somewhere that we do, because this is kind of big, big picture stuff, isn't it? So it, it really is, it's talking about the, you know, the story of all of the, the ancient uh, origins of, of the continents as we know them today. Yeah, I mean, that um, drawing is, uh, again, just a, an elegant piece of work capturing really complex um, movements, geophysics over billions of years of time um, into something s succinct that gives you uh, a way of thinking about the fluidity of the, of the continents moving in and out, um, the uh, constant cycling, recycling um, of um, Earth's processes um, and, and how do you sort of map that two-dimensionally. Yeah, um, and this is probably uh, a really uh, amazing sort of initial depiction. It's kind of um, similar to... Uh, 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 Charles Darwin's uh, um, little tree there and then he puts in the I think um, this is probably uh, a similar um, sort of exploration and trying to uh, grapple with the, the, the immensity the uh, eternity of, of the supercontinent cycle into a, into a simple sort of depiction and I also remember um, we, we sort of um, uh, developed that um, uh, and uh, obviously making the films but um, uh, turning this into a, a sand story to be able to uh, explain it um, uh, to to the Aboriginal people down at Uluru Karaju to Anunu um, for them to sort of uh, comprehend uh, um, you know the, the scientific data that we're looking at um, to explain um, the scientific or geological uh, um, uh, story of the formation of Uluru Karaju to which they got they got immediately they uh, understood it as a form of chukupa chukupa is is essentially has those um, um, uh, elements coming together and going away there is when they come together they um, change each other uh, in, um, in incredibly profound ways there's an element of um, destruction, transformation, uh, creation, recreation, and and so uh, in, in that sense, um, uh, there is um, uh, it echoes and uh, um, took apart in so many ways. So that that's a really powerful image. Uh, um, uh, and if you wanted to think about um, you know supercontinent cycle uh, and begin to think about it, this is a really good diagram to do that with. I remember uh, you see so you did the sand drawing out with the Aboriginal people out at Uluru, uh, a number of the artists. Um, I was discussing it with them later and I'd, I'd spoken to an artist colleague of mine, Alison Mooney, 
and asked her if she could do it in a scroll painting. And so she did that and she sent it to me and then I reworked it again. I provided her with that drawing that, that you're looking at. Uh, and then after I, I had the scroll, uh, I took it down to the artists at Uluru and then they reworked it again. And yes. that, you can see that in Iwara of the supercontinents, which That's is cool. in the... Yeah. Um, artist residency out at Uluru alongside unearthing Uluru. Uh, yeah. And that, that's, that's a singular work that, that nothing like it exists to, to a depiction of the story of the supercontinents as a, as a collaborative work between a number of us. Um, and, and that sketch there was one of the foundations to what became Iwa of the supercontinents. That's it. It's kind of a merging of um, uh, old and new sciences uh, um, coming together. I mean, the science b behind um, Aboriginal culture is has been around for tens of thousands of years um, and has clearly um, stood the test of time. And, and that merging of um, scientific data, basically, in that artwork, they depicted um, uh, what would have been well over two billion years of um, uh, of geophysics um, and and. What I really liked, and they added their own elements to it, when the, the continents came together to form the uh, supercontinents, they they depicted uh, um, the the uh, um, uh, the circles that depict us, um, a waterhole, the concentric circles, um, which is kind of a gathering, a meeting, um, and uh, this is where you get your um, your. Uh, creation, transformation, destruction, these things. And this is kind of what happens um, when they come together. You get these ideas that come together and when they meet and then they decide how they move forward um, and they sort of head out in different directions. So it, it, it certainly um, uh, resonated uh, with the uh, with the Ananu people when they looked at that story. You know, this is this is kind of what we do. We understand this This makes perfect sense. This is Chukupa. Um, uh, the earth does Chukupa. We do Chukupa. Everybody does Chukupa. So uh, um, it, it was a it was a great sort of um, uh, reconciliation of old and new ideas coming together and saying actually it's just um, uh, two two sides of the one coin. Yeah, seasons and cycles, macrocosms and microcosms. You know, it's all there in that artwork. But you know, yeah. again, thinking about the macrocosms and the microcosms, if we move on to the next slide, this is uh, Ellery Creek Big Hole and a whole lot more. I remember an amazing uh, image that you, you'd taken a satellite image and you had from Ellery Creek Big Hole and following it down and all of those different strata layers. So you showed it to me and uh, you, you took me through it and then I found uh, creatures that were according to those particular periods of deep time and embedded them into this illustration that I did. Um, which was based on the inspiration that, uh, from your image. But could you take us through this and, and tell us what we're seeing here in this incredible story of the landscape? I won't go any further than that, but I remember driving across it and realising, crikey, when we went in there, we're driving across deep time, literally across the horizontal layers of, of this deep time um, book of origins. So... Tell, could you tell us about that when you're heading into Ellery Creek Big Hole? What's what's the story? You're not just bouncing along, are you? <laughs> it's a, no, it's you're, you're not really bouncing along at all. Um, but yeah, so this particular image um, from the top down to the bottom, the top basically uh, uh, in terms of big time, that represents um, uh, the breakup of Rodinia about uh, a billion years ago. Before we then, start, though, where is Ellery Creek Big Hole in this? The Ellery Creek Big Hole is just west of um, Alice Springs. It's only a very, very short drive, very beautiful drive through um, uh, the actual mountains um, themselves uh, down along Lara Pinta Drive towards uh, Glen Helen and in the direction of Mount Sonda. And it's basically driving through a incredibly ancient landscape uh, it's like a museum in in it's kind of like driving through uh, a namajira painting uh it is so exuberant and colorful um and uh angular and um there's so it's gnarled it's twisted it's it's uh, um asymmetrical there is 
beauty um, in the, uh, um, the 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 bones of this really ancient mountain range, uh, um, uh, and you're you're like you just imagine you're uh, um, an ant going through the skeleton of of of, a, of an elephant and and uh, beholding the incredible wonder what it could have been, what it was like, um, and the, and uh, the life it, that it, um, it it had. So that's kind of one way of explaining um, the McDonald Ranges as you go head out to Ellery Creek. And then Ellery Creek um, is, is a snapshot. Uh, in, in short, essentially, this is what happens between supercontinent cycles, uh, between Rodinia and Pangaea, and um, moving from uh, the actual um, waterhole at Ellery Creek or Ellery Creek Big Hole right down um, towards um, Hermansburg in the south, you're basically covering about 650 million years of of um, geology of uh, um, of layers being um, uh, put down across probably one of the most extraordinary times in Earth's history, um, and including um, the Cambrian explosion, where 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 life was was microscopic. Um, it was certainly present. Uh, you had the um, it was abundant, but you couldn't sort of see it. Didn't have forms. Um, so, uh, so to help people understand, of course, what you're talking about here. If people hold up their hand and look at their fingers, you can see these fingers. Imagine that each one of your fingers horizontally hold them out, so they're, they're horizontal. Each one is a sedimentary layer. So, if my understanding is correct, what you're saying is they were kind of twisted. So, if people take their hands and twist it, so that those fingers are pointing upwards, sort of and then that, that top layer is kind of cut off, then you've got the, the sedimentary layers in deep time, but you're then you're actually able to like drive across them. So you're driving back through deep time. Is this is this correct? Yeah, that's it. It's um uh, probably uh, the best example way of understanding, I suppose, if um, uh, the Grand Canyon, to go back in time, you go down. Um, uh, these layers are tilted uh, nearly vertical. So uh, in order to go back in time, you start at the top um, uh, at Ellery Creek Big Hole and then you go basically as the water flows down, the water basically uh, um, uh, mirrors the direction or the arrow of time um, flowing down and, and even the loops and uh, um, uh, in the actual stream flow uh, r represent um, uh, the uh, the challenges that life would have had um, uh, as it went through the mass extinctions it would have uh, um, uh, sort of uh, held back and then flowed on and then been held back and then flows on meandering down looking for a way to um, to, to push through so the the the, the loops uh, um, and squiggles in the uh, river basically depict um, um, uh, life struggle as it's uh, becoming increasingly complex uh, multicellular with those complex body plans that you can see uh, depicted um, uh, in the drawing. You've got um, the Cambrian, you've got the, the different creatures clearly um, looking at um, bilateral symmetry. carboniferous symmetry. in there as well, carboniferous. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and interestingly enough, uh, uh, and they, uh, which is the local um, name for Ellery Creek, they, they have their own story of the, the fish dreaming, the honey ant dreaming, which uh, undergoes its own form um, uh, transformation. Um, and uh, as you go down the creek, um, the story changes uh, serendipitously, sort of echoes some um, uh, life and, and how that evolves and changes um, um, and the Aboriginal story associated with the, the flow of the creek also changes um, and reflects that um, sort of um, constant changing and adapting and um, um, basically becoming what we are uh, today and what we see around us today. So that's broadly speaking. So uh, what bracket of time do we cover? What we effectively have in the image, if you're looking close to the written details, I've got pre-Cambrian up at Ellery Creek Big Hole. Then you, you can see Cambrian, you can see Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian. That's the kind of bracket that I believe we spoke about more so. And I put little illustrations in each one. And then, of course, although it may not be there, once you, you follow that loop around, the next bracket being the Carboniferous, and I've got that in that bottom left corner. Although, specifically, we're not dealing so much with the Carboniferous, it is those earlier periods of time into the Precambrian, isn't it, Ben? But is that about the bracket that we're looking at there? Yeah, so that's the bracket um, uh, we're looking 
uh, the end of um, the pre-Cambrian and then uh, the Cambrian period is just um, south of the road itself, all the way down to the uh, Devonian and then the beginning of um, the, the Carboniferous. So essentially um, from the road south, uh, we're looking at um, uh, the body plan that we um, have uh, today uh, that's, that basically embraces bilateral symmetry, um, a head, tail um, and uh, um, parts on each line of the body that um, is evolved around moving. So from the road um, south, is, is that's basically when that started to happen. Um, the road coming in um, from Alice Springs along Lara Pinta Drive, that um, uh, road up into Ellery Creek, big hole when you turn uh, right heading up, that's sort of going back in time uh, towards the formation of um, uh, Rodinia or around Rodinia and you're going through snowball earth during the um, the Cryogenian period. This is essentially when earth was um, tussling with um, uh, itself and all around the, the carbon cycle trying to um, find a, a happy medium um, and essentially the, the what was uh, happening is that the uh, Earth's carbon cycle was thrown out of um, kilter um, with the advent of and the emergence, of rapid uh, emergence of, of life as a result of the breakup of Rodinia and, and they're basically trying to um, uh, um, correct itself there. So during that period, you've had these um, periods of incredible um, uh, uh, freezing of earth and then um, uh, sort of ice house, hot house, sort of drunkenly lurching from one to the other, trying to calibrate. But the natural systems, the checks and balances of, um, of earth basically um, steadied the ship, um, which set the scene for certainly the, the Ediacaran period, which is kind of where where the road goes um, west, you're travelling um, along the um, Ediacaran and then just south um, is the Cambrian uh, um, and looking south on your left as you drive along the road, that's basically um, where you've got that frenzy and atomic uh, tinkering of body plans and shells and teeth and armour and um, an arms race um, occurring um, certainly through the um, uh, the first maybe 20 million years of the of the Cambrian uh, period and then um, the rest is history going south. Yeah, the, it's, that's, that's incredible to think about the cryogeny and, uh, and the fluctuations of the extremes there and, of course, our saviour being plate tectonics and the, the volcanism that emancipated us from the ice. But, of course, what we, we're realising much to our alarm today is that natural systems aren't just something that happen on that very thin sliver of land stuff. They extend into the great aerial ocean. And uh, if you throw your natural systems out of balance, it's much harder to monetize the world through accretion and other things that we're so good at doing. It's a it's a precautionary tale, um, and uh, you know what we're doing with the atmosphere at the moment, um, with regards to carbon, is 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 uh, yeah, it's been done before, and uh, and it didn't um, go well, um, and uh, yeah, so I mean we've got we're as a species and our society and civilization we're so incredibly fragile uh, um, uh, that that kind of um, experimentation with carbon is is probably not well advised, uh, um, and that um, cryogene, whilst it occurred, you know, uh, 800 million years ago, it gives you an insight into into what can can certainly happen. Uh, uh, but yes, uh, um, uh, it was uh, it was a tumultuous time for um, for life on Earth itself. Uh, but it seemed to have set the scene um, for um, uh, the uh, the Cambrian explosion and life um, the uh, with the breakup of. Um, Rodinia and the uh, releasing of the abundance of bioessential um, elements um, um, and uh, all the incredible range of niches and of course the ice um, ground down a lot of the land and released a huge amount of um, uh, phosphorus in, into the system which is a key element um, in, in, in the, the productivity of, of, uh, of life biodiversity. It's a part of DNA uh, um, uh, that that whilst it was a bad uh, period, it sort of um, uh, set the stage and provided the ingredients for that um, ongoing uh, sort of complexification of, of life going forward. So um, uh, yeah, with every um, uh, cloud there is a silver lining. So uh, mm. that that uh, 
that that's very much uh, the case that's, there. So that's it. it's a fascinating period, really. It is, uh, and then just going um, the Ellery Creek kind of gives you that insight, um, uh, um, and you you literally as you you know walk as down um, the creek and uh, follow the, 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 the rate of flow, you uh, get to appreciate uh, um, deep time and, uh, and what it can do. Time is an incredible sculptor in, its, in itself, really. That's it. I mean, the lesson being that if you wake the crack and the gene streams will express themselves differently and our present company will not be included in the next experiment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the second Saurian age will rise. And, yeah. and mammals will have a tough time. Yeah. Um, chickens will do well. But, yeah, that's it. But, but I mean, uh, I'm just south of the, the road also, that's just, uh, interestingly, if you've been to Uluru Juta, if you're just looking just south, um, uh, the uh, Arambera um, formation basically is uh, is the same time that the uh, the strata of Uluru and Karajuta were, were were being um, deposited. So the, the the road itself basically depicts uh, fairly accurately the the, the rising of um, the Peterman Ranges and um, and the huge amount of sedimentation coming off that um, to create the strata of Uluru and Karajuta. Just just look out um, uh, your window on the on the left hand side. You'll see the Arambera um, formation, and you think ah, that's when um, uh, Uluru is beginning its um, its its formation. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating. And look, in moving on to the next slide, we we talk about this fluidity. It gives us a, a more detailed um, expression of, of Goss's bluff, but also we can see a lot more in there, can't we? We can absolutely. Um, so yeah, geology fluidizes rocks. So if we look up, we can see Mount Gillen. And then the heavy tree quartzite that you've spoken to me about previously, could you tell me a bit about that? So the heavy tree quartzite uh, is the oldest uh, layer um, in the Amadeus Basin uh, right across Central Australia. It is essentially um, cooked uh, sandstone. It's uh, uh, cooked under immense pressure. I mean, you've got to think about kilometres of sediment um, and the equivalent of about 600 uh, 650 million years of sedimentation on top of um, the first layer that was basically sand that um, came in around uh, Central Australia from all the different directions. And you find uh, um, the heavy tree quartzite and different um, incarnations right across um, Central Australia. But it is what caps um, the um, West McDonald Ranges, the McDonald Ranges um, uh, right across uh, east and west of Alice Springs, um, and it's incredibly hard and very durable, and marks the the the, the beginning um, of the uh, Amadeus Basin stratigraphy, which is uh, logs the different layers um, from the oldest to the to the youngest, um, and it manifests itself in so many different ways um, around uh, the McDonald Ranges, um, and you see it also on top of um, Mount Sonda as well, on top actually, uh, um, it's kind of uh, turned upside down, which sort of tells you about the power that was uh, pushed into the McDonald Ranges. So it is essentially um, sandstone that's been cooked and compressed and turned into to quartzite as incredibly resistant um, and and as a result uh, um, uh, assists today uh, and, and caps a lot of the um, uh, peaks and um, uh, the tops of the ranges around um, Alice Springs North and oh, no, West and East. So, uh, yeah, uh, it is just a, it's a beautiful um, uh, piece of geology as well. It's extraordinary. The next slide, as we move along, actually focuses in a little bit further on Gosses Bluff. So, um, I, I really that fluidity, uh, and when you explain to me the the uh, sublime um, impact moment that this was the the sketch that I I did, I think it was that night after going out there with you. Um, it really, really had an impact on me <laughs> as well as the landscape. Yeah, so, yeah, this is um, uh, one of those um, places that uh, you, you just, um, when you look at it um, and um, 
when you first look at it, I mean, for the first explorers that went out there and they looked at it and they just saw a, um, a cliff or a bluff and then they kind of moved on, but they didn't really appreciate um, uh, what it was until much, much later when they started um, during, uh, doing uh, aerial photography of um, Central Australia and then when they uh, looked uh, closer at it, then they realised, oh, my God, this is not just a, a bluff or a cliff. Um, this is actually a crater um, in, in our midst in, in cent central Australia and um, immediately uh, drew a huge amount of um, attention uh, to try and understand it. And it took uh, quite a long time for them to understand um, uh, the origin of it. Um, but essentially what we're looking there is... Uh, um, uh, uh, a comet crater, a comet that came in uh, hurtling into Earth's um, atmosphere about 142 and a half million years ago, didn't actually um, hit. It is a comet, um, so it, uh, the Earth's atmosphere being the protective layer of, of our planet um, uh, did a fantastic job in uh, um, breaking it all apart there, but um, the, the speed at which it came in certainly compressed the atmosphere and created a, um, a crater quite deep and uh, quite extensive around um, and forming the actual crater and bringing up a lot of the, the deep-seated geology to the, to the surface itself. So uh, in, in itself uh, um, um, uh, has remained like a crater and a lot of craters actually um, uh, erode away and disappear and uh, don't look like craters over uh, over a short period of time but this one in particular um, is, is quite vivid mainly because of the um, the geology that it was able to to bounce out of the earth um, uh, and it's the same geology that you see around the James Range just south um, itself is, is fairly um, tough and resilient um, and is able to resist the um, uh, the effects of time, and so you you still have the uh, the the ring, the crater like um, structure um, uh, quite vividly there, and uh, it gives you sort of a, an understanding uh, that um, of the power of of the actual um, energy released um, and the and the comet that um, came in, and it kind of reminds you again just um, uh, that Earth itself, um, everything that we see on Earth has fallen from the sky um, and uh, that it still affects the earth in many ways and can uh, in a way redirect um, uh, the, the history of earth and its unfolding story um, with these incredible collisions. Obviously Chichalup, um, which the crater um, in the Yucatan clearly changed the story of, of, of life on earth, certainly for the dinosaurs and gave um, um, uh, sort of the etch-a-sketch effect uh, um, and out with the old in with the new and um, uh, set the uh, scene for the rise of the mammals era um, uh, and the, these, you know, that the Earth is very much a part of the Milky Way and the cosmos um, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and these events certainly remind us that um, this is happening and, and again, the local Aboriginal story uh, um, uh, vividly depicts um, this in a really beautiful way and it's certainly worth uh, um, uh, actually uh, spending some time out there and um, and uh, listening to the story out there. And that, of course, is in the far west. But if we we think about the, the place, one of the wonders of the place is there's so many immersed stories within stories. If we move on to the next slide, we can see the uh, map that is in there, Central Australia, the area in green, that's the, the region that we're talking about in question. Uh, and the illustration that I've got there was an experience that I had in the eastern Macdonald Ranges, being out with a geologist. The sketch above that, we have uh, something from the eastern Macdonalds, it was Trophina Gorge. That was, again, another one of these spectacular places. So, yeah, Tr Trophina Gorge um, in the eastern Macdonald Ranges is uh, a lesser visited, lesser known part of the Macdonald Ranges. Um, it is essentially a, a reflection uh, uh, of the West Macdonald Ranges, but eastward, um, and uh, has a lot to offer in terms of um, uh, nature and uh, geology. Uh, in some cases, probably more interesting, uh, some of the features there, particularly the uh, Bitter Springs um, formation is very, very vivid um, um, out towards the um, eastern Macdonald Ranges there. But Trophina Gorge in itself is just a, one of those really incredibly 
beautiful, serene places, um, and an incredibly colourful and uh, uh, richly storied as well by the local uh, Eastern Islander people. Yeah, it, it was a day to remember, that's for sure. Um, if we moving on from Trofina Gorge and those two examples, so in this next sketch we see Chambers Pillar. That was again an incredible experience. Very ancient. How old is that, Ben? Oh yeah. So this is an incredible um, rock formation south of Alice Springs. Uh, and it is quite striking at, um, as you come over the sand dunes and all of a sudden you get these um, pillars of rock. This is just one of um, a number of different um, rock formations around Chambers Pillar, or locally known as uh, Itikwara. And uh, locally it has a very important story uh, associated with that, uh, particularly around um, uh, the uh, Moati um, skin and skin, skin um, laws um, that govern the uh, um, the relationship of the Aranda people, the southern Aranda people uh, in that area. But the actual geology itself is uh, very similar to the Marini sandstone that you find right across um, uh, central Australia there. The Marini sandstone is um, one of the most um, beautiful sandstones that you find in central Australia, and you see it a lot around Kings Canyon. And it's for the Marini sandstone that you, you a lot of the water uh, that um, is found uh, underground uh, is drawn from. Um, it is wind deposited, and so it doesn't have the, the saltiness of the, some of the uh, strata in uh, around central Australia, like the Pakuta sandstone um, um, is uh, where we find water and also oil, and a lot of the drinking water comes from. But if you can get drinking water from the Marini sandstone, it is it tastes absolutely um, superb. It's like um, a fine wine uh, when it comes to, to drinking water from, from a rock. But the Marini sandstone is something else again, and also just uh, creates some of the most beautiful um, landscapes in Central Australia. Incredible, incredible. Yeah, and the depth of time, you know, those connections to deep time. I, I remember if we look in the next slide, Adam Yates, a paleontologist from uh, the Central Australian Museum, uh, showing me uh, an ancient bit of fossil from a stromatolite. So in this next illustration, you can see that I've included some sketches of stromatolites there. This was actually a sketch that I did out at Shark Bay, Hamlin Pool, of the stromatolites there. But they are obviously connected through the fossil evidence to Central Australia. Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, stromatolites. I, I see uh, uh, fossilised stromatolite. I take my hat off. I say thank you for the air that we breathe today. Uh, it is basically um, the first life that occurred uh, in a visible form on the planet and that uh, gave rise basically to the oxygen that we breathe. And uh, you see it in abundance um, right across Central Australia and the different geologies. And, and the, the, the next slide um, on is, um, is Corroboree Rock that you find out at Eastern McDonnell Ranges. In, in its entirety is the, the bitter string it is Springs Formation, which is uh, where the stromatolites um, uh, really thrived uh, and uh, did its fabulous work in increasing the oxygen levels of our planet. Um, and in a way, I suppose, sort of played um, a role in the um, uh, in the snowball earth. But uh, um, uh, it, it is just one of those incredible sites that you have uh, in a, in Central Australia, which just it subtly rises out and uh, showcases um, uh, a piece of deep time, uh, and that demands your attention and and um, and basically an understanding of its part um, in the the story of Earth and how we we've got what we've got today. Yeah, and it's an incredible yeah. thing, isn't it? When you think about that, rainbows have spent the majority of their the lifetime of uh, expressing <laughs> that. Um, in pink skies and uh, then moving into the purple and into the blue that we have today thanks to these microbial life forms. So we've yep. got a huge amount to be thankful for. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, uh, um, with the with the advent of oxygen, you have fire and with fire you, you, you get so much more um, in the... Um, uh, uh, variety and what you can do, you know, from a... Um, uh, biochemical point of view um, and also 
just um, um, with with oxygen. Um, uh, it also sort of created um, a, a new suite of mineralisation in Earth and sort of gave uh, um, Earth something more to play with. Uh, I suppose it's kind of like when you upgrade from Duplo Lego to Technica, you, these minerals that have been oxidised uh, by the presence of oxygen are um, far more complex and they can do more. They're, uh, they're um, structurally more interesting and then life has all, all of a sudden got all these new toys to to start building something more complex so oxygen was absolutely key to the complex uh, complexification of life uh, um that we we have and, and and setting the stage for the cambrian explosion so oh, incredible the take your hat off but all con- the time continual interplay between slow flow and fast flow we see in this next sketch trophina gorge again from a different vantage point you can see how the the water shapes the rock the rock shapes the water and life between the two rises up in all its expressions so trophina gorge uh, incredible experience Uh, again that's that's to the east so we're bouncing from the east to the west and and all around we're looking at these details but that's the nature of this cubist approach to landscape um, if we move on to the next sketch... If you're going to do a long multi-day walk um, in Central Australia, it's the Lara Pinta Trail that goes from Alice Springs 220-odd kilometres um, out west along the McDonald Ranges to the finishing point um, uh, to the spectacular Mount Sonder uh, overlooking uh, the West McDonald Ranges. Um, and it's just a stunning uh, um, journey through uh, the ranges and and um, all the different textures the colors um, the patterns um, really sort of it is and particularly the trees um, through the McDonald ranges um, and most um, often it's the the ghost gums uh, that you see which are striking they uh, this is barren um, earth and then these ghost gums come out um, and the, you can sense their antiquity and their um, their story. Uh, no two gum trees, ghost gum trees, are, are the same, and uh, they are uh, complete, um, completely different from each other. And they, when you look at it and you look again closely, like you've done here, um, Ben, uh, you can sort of unpick their story, what they've gone through to be able to to survive and um, and thrive, and look absolutely magnificent um, in these um, really. Uh, um, uh, exposed um, landscapes. Um, and it's great. You see that contrast between that uh, red and then the white and then the green. It's something to, to behold as you walk through and along the uh, McDonald Ranges uh, and, that was, and, and along the Lara Pinta Trail. Yeah, cutting into deep time in that regard and is rock billions of years old. Uh, it was uh, at that time the oldest thing I'd, I'd ever touched. I mean, the water was freezing but i was amazed to see the impact that water has on the landscape but moving on to the next slide we can see stanley chasm and that's that's a different story isn't it i actually i remember i been out at goss's bluff we we'd met someone from brisbane and he had ancient well not that old fairly recent i think they were old photos from the 1940s and he was trying to line them up with where you know, because it was one out of Goss's Bluff, this this old black and white photo, and um, he thought he was at the right place. And I remember you were somewhere else, and I lined it up. So yeah, yeah, that's that's it. And then um, serendipitously happened to meet him a few days later out at Stanley Chasm, and and there he was again, trying to figure out where this old photo lined up with his. Um, and then we realised I had to kind of climb a bit up Stanley Chasm, so I climbed up a bit of it. And then lined it up and then bang, the photo was there and realised that these people with this ancient camera from the 1940s had climbed up this thing and taken a photo in there. It was was amazing. But Stanley Chasm has a different story of origins to it, doesn't it? It's not just the flow of water. There's more going on. It's rock and rock, isn't it? Uh, It is. So Stanley Chasm, um, uh, its story kind of um, starts maybe 1.6 billion years ago, um, uh, 
you know, at the end of um, the Nuna supercontinent cycle. Um, uh, so the, the the quartzite that you see there isn't uh, the heavy tree quartzite. It's the Chewing's Range quartzite. So again, it's sandstone that's uh, been cooked and turned um, and compressed and turned into a really hard quartzite. Um, and uh, that that is basically um, the result of um, uh, mountain building uh, episode uh, as a result of Nuna and then um, and creating huge amounts of sedimentation towards the end of that time period. Then, uh, and uh, what the, 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 that's what you see on either side of the chasm itself. The actual um, gap and the chasm itself is a, as a result of um, uh, uh, the uh, Stuart Pass dolerite. So um, that basically occurred during the period of Rodinia about uh, a billion years ago when um, Australia was uh, temporarily stretched um, and in the middle of that um, with any stretching you're going to get um, uh, any uh, fractures, faults um, occurring and then any um, magma um, sitting below the ranges there will um, sort of move through those cracks and widen them up and um, emplace themselves into into the um, um, into those gaps and they create the, the, the dikes or the dorite dikes that you have throughout the McDonald Ranges. So, uh, and then that's actually fairly soft uh, and then readily uh, 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 erodes down. So uh, in the next sort of um, uh, incarnation of um, Central Australia during the um, Alice Springs orogeny, during the time of Pangaea, um, the Central Ranges were um, thrown up and all those deep um, faults and fractures were um, thrown up uh, quite close to the surface there and then the uh, erosion of course um, occurred and then those dikes were exposed and readily and quickly um, uh, uh, eroded down because it was much much short, softer than the actual quartzite itself and then created these um, uh, these chasms and gorges that you have so Stanley Chasm is just one of it's probably the the best example of um, the Stuart Pass dolerite dike um, and uh, you you do have have them sort of peppered throughout the um, that part of the uh, McDonald Range, but that's the best example of that. And it actually goes back quite extensively towards the north, uh, the chasm. But that's that part there where it's like about five metres wide um, and that incredible height. Um, and uh, and with the uh, the dike uh, eroding away, you've got this beautiful chasms there. So essentially, what you're seeing there is the product again of um, three supercontinent cycles. Uh, if you if you want to um, uh, build a chasm, create a chasm from scratch, you, you need to um, uh, have at least uh, three supercontinent cycles to create that that extraordinary um, uh, geological feature just um, west of Alice Springs there. So it gives you um, a sense of the push me pull um, of Earth's crust pushing, pulling, pushing, pulling, and 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 essentially this is what will happen. You get um, beautiful features like the Stanley uh, Stanley Chasm, um, and of course it, it is embedded deeply with um, its own um, uh, Western Arundel story. That's just stunning. In relation to that, this fluidity of, of rock again, uh, and these these deep time stories. One of the things that really impressed me, if we move along to the next slide, was my first experience of Simpsons Gap. So I went there and I, I did a sketch of it. And I, oh, I was amazed at the, the layering of the rock. Uh, what can you tell us about Simpsons Gap when people go there? That was just so, stunning. Yeah, Simpsons Gap uh, um, is yeah just east of Alice Springs, uh, only a short drive. Um, one of the most pleasant things to do is uh, in the uh, late afternoon, evening time, uh, as the sun sets in the west, um, the, the actual um, uh, gap uh goes in, into shadow and it becomes an incredibly serene, cool place to see. And you see the um, uh, the rock wallabies uh, merging out and uh, starting to move around and looking for something to, to, to eat, um, after, especially after a hot day as well. And, of course, the, um, the fig trees in that area are just absolutely exquisite. But the, the actual geology itself um, uh, is um, what you would see 
sort of a um, heavy tree gap, but um, uh, inverted and sloping in the opposite direction. Uh, you've got the, uh, again, the heavy tree uh, quartzite that caps the McDonnell Ranges um, uh, east and west of um, Alice Springs. But then underlying that, um, you've got the, the, the base rock, the, the Saturday Nice, which uh, is 1.6 billion years old. Um, and again, you, you, you see something there. You're sitting in the geology, um, uh, geology that was created three supercontinent cycles ago, uh, uh, with Nuna and then, um, uh, capped with that is the, uh, um, heavy tree quartzite formed and created, um, at the end of Rodinia. So again, so you're looking at a place that has taken 700, uh, 800 million years to, to, to form in two, uh, supercontinent cycles. So if you're feeling the antiquity of the place, that's essentially what that's all about. Yeah. Amazing. So moving on to the next slide, we can see Ormiston Gorge, uh, just another one of those spectacular places um, in the McDonald Ranges uh, west of Alice Springs uh, and not too far from Mount Sonder. Uh, Ormston Gorge uh, is a powerful place because uh, it has been created by powerful forces, so powerful, so much that uh, the landscape effectively has been turned upside down in many ways. Uh, uh, the ge geology um, here is mind blowing uh, when you comprehend uh, uh, that uh, you, you see and get a sense of the, of the power behind uh, um, mountain building, particularly in the Western McDonald Ranges. So, um, Ormiston Gorge, uh, um, uh, you, you, the, the actual creek that comes through, it's uh, again like uh, many of the creeks that you find through uh, the gaps and gorges of the Western McDonald Ranges. The water itself is incredibly cold, uh, kind of like um, uh, Ellery Creek Big uh, Hole, and here in particular it's a great place to go swimming. And the contrast between the the, 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 the red baking uh, surrounding landscape and the incredibly cold water uh, when you immerse yourself into it is extraordinary. Yeah, um, they, uh, that, that, that contrast is sort of mind-blowing. And it's Kind of in keeping with the landscape itself. So again, you've got um, uh, incredibly old geology. Again, uh, um, what you're seeing there is the result of three supercontinent cycles over 1.7 um, billion years there. But in particular, um, what you're seeing there, um, the, the twisted Nard landscape, um, uh, is the result of uh, the Alice Springs orogeny. Um, and the, the sheer power of it, um, 20 um, kilometres of, um, of horizontal geology sort of being turned upside down um, and on itself. It's kind of like when you're kneading bread and you flip it over um, and, uh, and um, on, onto itself. This is kind of um, what you're seeing there. And then you think, my God, this earth is kind of kneading the crust like if it was, um, if it was bread. And, and, and that's what you're, what you're seeing there. And, uh, um, and the erosion over the last or well, subsequent 300 million years exposing the, the, uh, the inside, uh, um, the very foundation, the roots of these um, uh, massive mountains that would have occurred uh, during the Alice Springs erogeny uh, and, uh, and the formation and the assembly of Pangaea. Stunning stuff. And talking about, of course, there's, you know, deep time stories encapsulated within striking features that we see today. The next one along is, of course, Uluru. And I hadn't seen Uluru at the time when I drew this. It was the next residency along when I went out to Uluru. We did the unearthing of Uluru with the incredible Heather Duff. Um, but this was just this awareness that this was not the whole story. Just as deep time is, is so the case, uh, the, the story of Uluru was submerged and so that's what I was trying to convey. I'd seen all these pictures of Uluru that were like, there's Uluru, there's the sand, there's the rock. But I was saying, no, no, this is this thing goes deep down, <laughs> you know, and it's this story of incredible powers of folding and twisting. So uh, you, could you tell us a little bit about that? So that's it. Um, one of the first things that um, uh, you see when you're coming into Uluru, 
particularly from Alice Springs out in the distance, is the rising of this uh, of this rock formation again, just abruptly, almost rudely out of the uh, um, the desert landscape. Uh, um, and again, it sort of um, demands your attention, and you look at it, and you're uh, absolutely blown away by uh, its magnitude, its height, um, its grandeur, its antiquity, its um, its gnarliness. You sense um, there's been uh, quite a story here, um, and uh, and it's basically ongoing. But what you learn quickly is that um, this is just the tip of an iceberg, literally the tip of the iceberg. What you see is um, the, the very top and that uh, Uluru is um, much, much bigger than what you see already, much more massive and mostly underground. Uh, it it, it um, sort of blows your mind in terms of that this is has been tilted um, almost to the to the vertical by the the, the forces um, uh, within within the earth itself, um, and uh, these um, lines used to be horizontal. These vertical lines that you see today um, at Uluru used to be horizontal and have been uh, tilted to the vertical position um, by the forces uh, that the same forces that made um, the McDonald Ranges um, has tilted Uluru to to the vertical position, and and. And you, you know there's a lot more down uh, deep below um, the, the actual sand itself and, and, and this is just the, the most resilient um, uh, part of, of Uluru itself. And of course that's no reason to think that this story of Uluru getting larger won't continue for quite a long time until perhaps Australia collides up further and you, you have a very different kind of uh, Central Australian story as it starts to green out again with the giant mountain ranges to the north of Amasia. But coming back to where we are now, the Peterman mountain ranges, we're talking about this recycling of material on Uluru is this finer material that is washed further afield from the Peterman mountain ranges, these Himalaya sized mountains as they erode down. But of course, Cata de Judah being closer to them is the most more conglomerate type of material. And you can see that in the next sketch, this expression of fluidity again. I mean, that was one of the themes I was trying to capture. I wasn't trying to um, necessarily depict actually does it what it looked like. I was trying to convey that this stuff's all in motion. It's all fluid. It looks solid, but it's actually deep time fluidicized is kind of everything. So the Cata de Judah story and the Uluru story connected through this this narrative of the flow of water eroding giant mountains and what kind of material do you get at what proximities from that ancient mountain range. Would that be correct? Yeah, absolutely. Water is um, uh, a key uh, player in um, the formations that we see right across Central Australia, um, uh, the sedimentary layers that um, make up Uluru, the Mutijulu um, Arcos and the conglomerate of um, Tarajuta were put there by water, um, uh, taking the uh, sediments from the Peterman Ranges and placing them across vast um, alluvial plains. Uh, and then, of course, water again played a role in the um, their lithification um, sediments turned into rocks with the Larup into sea, uh, um, compressing uh, with its successive layers um, on top of that. Um, and then, uh, of course, um, you have uh, almost like the fluidity of the Earth's um, mantle, I suppose, um, but just in much slower motion that uh, um, uh, pushes these um, mountains up and drives these um uh, tectonic plates together to create these incredible mountains and then of course uh, these mountains create their own weather that brings in uh, water and that um, again sort of um, tears them down and uh, the very shape of these um, uh, particularly around uh, um, Karajuta which is faulted and fractured all throughout and water uh, plus time creates some um, uh, these beautiful round shapes, um, time, nature, pause, right angles, and uh, quickly um, starts to round them off, water, wind. Um, and then you can see, even if you don't see the water there, given it's a desert, uh, you can see where it's been and how it's worked over a huge amount of time there. So places particularly like um, Karajuta gives you a sense of the, of the power of water over immense 
time and and how it can create these incredible um, shapes and features um, in places like Karajutu and Uluru. And you see some of the, the creek beds and they're dry and you think, oh my God, there's, there's never water here. But then, of course, eventually, you know, it rains further north or it rains on location. If we look at the next slide, that was from, I remember being struck by this kind of blob of water that was making its way down this totally dried up creek bed. Uh, there'd been rains further to the north and uh, we went out to see this actually happening and you could see this blob of water. Like, <laughs> you know, you could see the stream behind us. Like, oh, it was so incredible watching the, the blob kind of moving down this ancient dried up creek bed. So that was... Yeah a bit of a sketch of what was happening there and as you know flying around and in encompassing the, the trees that had grown up through this as well and there's other images of course in there you can see uh, my goodness gracious columbia i mean is that another name for nuna it is yeah, yeah it's, um, look where australia uh, is ben like like just to point out to everyone everyone needs to at this point look at where australia is it's upside down as far as we're concerned in our experience of australia and and you can see that the, the east coast was <laughs> sort of once the west coast but the east coast it doesn't exist uh at, at this time um as we understand it's sort of broken hill is just kind of where where you would you would you know get a bit of waterfront um but then it has to twist around a full 180 degrees and so it's it's doing that clockwise. It's just, just extraordinary, isn't it? All of these expressions in Central Australia of the the fluidity of rock through deep time and all the different uh, perspectives that we have on that, and um, I attempted to touch on them through the artwork, uh, all encompassed by this story of this incredible Australian continent, ancient continent, uh, twisting clockwise as it accretes other bits to it and loses bits from it and travels around the planet yeah um so yeah that's uh, columbia is the um uh, the other name or nuna um and yes you're looking at uh, australia effectively upside down uh, there that's one of the fun facts about australia it spent more more time in the northern hemisphere than it has in the southern hemisphere and, and most of that time was um, upside down. You can so, all, also see that the east coast of Australia and that depiction there is missing. That that was um, added on, accreted on uh, during the last supercontinent cycle um, and, uh, and it gives you sort of some, an appreciation of how much Australia has sort of travelled around the, the globe. Um, and and I use the analogy is like uh, Australia, it's uh, um, deep time history through um, plate tectonics and the supercontinent cycle is reminiscent of a, of a, a young Australian backpacker going around the world uh, um, and exploring and picking up um, uh, experiences and sharing his own experiences with other other uh, um, people around the world and, and, and eventually sort of coming back um, to back home richly um, ex uh, richly endowed with all of these events and encounters with um, other other people around the world so I mean the the, the, the analogy there between an Aussie backpacker and a and the continent itself there is is um, is quite uncanny really yeah um, and and pretty much um, uh, provides an incredibly rich narrative truly is the case and if we move on to the next slide the rich narrative continues at king's canyon you can see just above that uh you can sort of make out australia in the devonian world it's certainly by now in the southern hemisphere there's far more recent times but you know again deep deep stories i've i've been out at um Winjana gorge which is an ancient coral reef from devonian times and you know, Devonian times are certainly encapsulated in the central Australian rocks as well. But Kings Canyon, that, that was something else. Like, I just couldn't believe the sheer, like, you know, cut of the thing. Um, this image was provided, um, and Marley had reworked this digitally, and um, then I did some further reworking on it. So Marley has a presence in this, just not just beyond all the amazing scientific illustrations. 
uh, that you can see in the artwork, but also in these features as well. So, I mean, what on earth would cut through the rock like that? You could see some parts just fallen away. Uh, do you have any understanding on the formation of Kings Canyon? And could you give people a bit of an under, like, where are we in relation to Alice Springs here? So um, Kings Canyon, uh, Wapaka National Park is roughly between Alice Springs and uh, Uluru Karajuta. And it sort of sits um, uh, just north of uh, Lake Amadeus. Uh, and it is quite extraordinary. Yeah. Um, so for Kings Canyon, for me, I mean, in contrast to maybe uh, Uluru, Karajuta, Kings Canyon um, is like looking at red rock from above and down into it. Uluru is kind of red rock going around it. Um, and then Karajuta, you're sort of immersed in it. Um, it's certainly red rock done very, very dramatically, very, very differently. Um, um, and it, it is quite um, striking and very different from the experiences that you have down at uh, Uluru and Karajuta. And then on some days, uh, you can almost, on a really clear day, you can almost see uh, um, the tops of Karajuta from some uh, viewpoints um, from Kings Canyon across um, uh, uh, Lake Amadeus. Uh, the actual um, uh, cliffs that you see at Kings Canyon is basically a result of um, just um, uh, rocks just falling down, um, uh, hanging on for dear life, but the, the creek down below uh, slowly excavates all the material out and um, uh, the, the rock strata, even though it's uh, basically a marini sandstone, incredibly strong in its own right, um, eventually gravity wins over and it just collapses um, down into the um, canyon itself and then eventually into the creek where it gets um, uh, eventually washed out and then creates this beautiful silky sand that you have just south of Kings Canyon itself. So um, it is uh, much older than uh, the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon and, and its formation uh, is you know, sort of roughly about 10 million years, uh, a quick um, formation of the canyon there. But in comparison uh, to Kings Canyon, um, it, it is... Um, uh, a, um, a slow fuse that um, has created um, this going back 50, maybe 60 million years. And essentially, Kings Canyon is um, um, a syncline. Um, so it's like a V shape, a very, very shallow V shape. And then uh, when the rain basically falls onto this V shape, um, it creates all these micro canyons at the at the edge of it. And then as the water flows in and joins um, forces, uh, the base of the uh, of the V creates the, the 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 canyon itself. And then at the top end of the canyon, you get this beautiful waterfall whenever it does rain. And then down into um, uh, into the creek below and then flows out, basically taking all the sediments um, with it and um, and slowly um, uh, creating the, the circumstances in which the, the walls the, of the canyon walls, despite the fact that they look pretty solid, um, will eventually over uh, a long period of time will um, basically um, drop off and um, crumble down into the base of the creek and, and then and get excavated out and um, and distributed across um, uh, the wide sandy plains, which creates its own environment, um, uh, particularly uh, um, popular for, for, for kangaroos and echidnas and um, snakes and uh, throughout the, the, um, the flood uh, plain uh, that you'd find just south of um, Kings Canyon and the creek eventually makes its way down to uh, um, uh, Lake Armadais where all the water basically evaporates and leaves the salt behind. Uh, but uh, uh, it is an extraordinary place. Uh, um, fossils um, everywhere that you uh, you walk, um, uh, you in some of the places there you can still see <laughs> the fossils are incredible. They, there's one part there, Cottle um, Lookout, where you can see a track of a um, uh, sea creature moving um, uh under the strata and then it sort of rises up and there's a lot of layers there and then you go to the other side of the little hillock and then it um, um, comes out at the other end uh it's that's literally a, like a wormhole through this through this um uh um, incredible geology and the marini sandstone is like one of my favorite geologies um um in uh, Central Australia because it is so beautiful. It's wind deposited. You've got these crisscrossing um, patterns, um, and as it erodes and slowly decays, it creates these beautiful um, patterns of taffany and creates these again um, 
uh, helix, um, all these bulbous shapes. Again, nature abhors um, right angles and lines and it quickly um, uh, sort of uh, takes out these corners. It's kind of like watching a, an ice cube uh, uh, melt. It's the corners that come off. And then, I mean, if you wanted to see... Uh, the tops of um, Kings Canyon uh, in how it's shaped. Just to get a bunch of ice cubes, put them down on the on the um, on the surface of your kitchen bench, and just over the hour, watch them slowly become uh, these spherical domes. Uh, and, and and that's basically uh, you've got a, a real life. Um, uh, it, appreciation of how the, the tops of Kings Canyon and the domes um, that you see on top of Kings Canyon, uh, the, the on top of the, the, the wings of the V that comes down into the canyon itself. Uh, so, I mean, it's... It's a, it's a magical environment, um, and for, um, for again for the Aboriginal people, um, uh, richly storied throughout here. It is a fallback area for them. Um, it's an area that they preserved um, during um, the uh, times of abundance, and then uh, during the times of drought, um, these places were well kept and um, appreciated, um, and uh, they would fall back into these areas and. Um, uh, basically survived the really tough long droughts because it was a place of water and abundance and, and not just Kings Canyon all the way along to uh, along the, um, uh, the the range itself um, uh, along to Alan, um, Catherine Springs is the whole place is magical and you can spend a lot of time out there it's a stunning area incredible incredible place and yeah I, I was very very struck by it walking around and seeing this bizarre honeycomb domes at the, at the top of it, they're sort of like the bungle bungles, and most they unusual. They are. They're um, similar to the bungle bun, and and the same mechanism basically applies um, uh, to Kings Canyon as it does um, in the bungle bungles. Again, nature um, ab abhors um, uh, corners and straight lines. It's the same set of uh, laws of physics uh, in the bungle bungles as it is um, in Kings Canyon. So uh, um, those those beautiful domes are uh, um, uh, just just exquisite. They really are. It's an enchanted um, landscape. It really is. Mm, incredible. And look, moving on to the next slide, what can you tell us about this one? Um, so this is uh, Glen Helen, the gorge at uh, Glen Helen, one of the most uh, striking features in the West McDonnell Ranges west of Alice Springs, not far from Mount Sonder itself. Um, so again, this is uh, where the Fink River, one of the oldest uh, rivers in Australia, if not the world, uh, flows through, cuts through uh, the, um, uh, the the vertical tilted um, um, layers that make up the Armadeus Basin. Uh, so here it sort of kinks around uh, and then through through the gap. Uh, the, the river itself locally known as the Lara Pinta, which uh, roughly translates into, into salty water. And it is salty for a number of different reasons of the fact that um, uh, it is a desert river. There's a lot of evaporation, but there's a lot of um, salt that comes out of the actual uh, rock strata, particularly around here uh, where we've got the Pakuta sandstone and a little bit further later. We've got the Marini sandstone that uh, um, that you see in Kings Canyon and other parts around Central Australia is also uh, present here just um, south of, that, um, of the gap. So we're looking... Um, through the gap south uh, and towards Hermansburg. And Hermansburg is also um, at the township just west of Alice Springs is also on uh, the Lara Pinta Fink River. So just um, uh, behind us, I suppose, looking at uh, the gap, um, we've got the, the, the where the Fink River rises up and around uh, uh, Mount Sonder and um, starts to uh, gather volume and girth um, and really can flow here. And during the flooding events, um, uh, the, the the gap is uh, actually too narrow to let the water come through um, at volume. So it, it actually um, uh, floods back um, behind us and around us and creates this incredible um, uh, flooding effect uh, and then basically um, uh, squirts or bursts through this gap here. And uh, Glen Helen is actually also very culturally significant to the uh, to the Western Aranda people here. And in fact, this is where um, uh, a lot of the uh, um, uh, fish that you find throughout Central Australia, this is um, one of the few places where you have um, a relatively permanent water hole 
along with uh, um, uh, Ellery Creek uh, further east. Uh, this is a, a permanent water hole because of the, uh, the where how the river kinks um, and then uh, the river uh, deeply gouges out uh, um, uh, uh, quite a deep water hole and you get the fish even during times of uh, drought and where you haven't had rain for a long time, water persists here and the fish will um, um, stay quite deep down in the water hole and actually um, eke out a, a living there. So one of, I think one of our um, endemic species of fish here uh, can be found here at um, uh, Glen Helen. They're also a really beautiful place. Incredible, incredible rich in in deep time as well as, as as so to are all of these places but moving along to the next one it, it is extraordinary so many different places so many different expressions of the interplay between rock water life and so too in this next image of trophina gorge uh, but look moving let's move along from that one because in this next one I remember this was the first walk that uh, we went on together. You took me out to Palm Valley, an uh, extraordinary place. Uh, and they, they'd, uh, there were some different ideas on how the hell did these palms get here, but now it's believed the indigenous people uh, brought them from the north and uh, brought them down to this place. Is, that's correct, isn't it, isn't it? It is, yes. Uh, um, so originally they thought um, that um, the, these palms um, uh, made their own way down um, from uh, the north uh, in some sort of formal fashion, but um, uh, the Western Islander people insisted that um, they had a hand in that um, particular uh, um, uh, part of the story of their story, the um, red cabbage palms that you find in Palm Valley, uh, and uh, they had stories um, that um, the connection to the north um, and central Australia that uh, they they brought them down and um, uh, included them in their uh, particular part of the world there. So it is uh, again sort of tells you about um, uh, the Western Islander people and the Aboriginal people across central Australia. Generally speaking, their incredible uh, reach they had, not just um, uh, in their area and understanding uh, how to live um, in a really tough environment, but um, uh, their knowledge and uh, trading relationships and connections to far reaches around Australia. So this is probably one of the best examples of that. Yes, it was it was an extraordinary day being out there. And... Um... Something it is an, certainly it's an amazing place. Uh, yeah. um, you, you, so you're basically surrounded by the Hermansburg sandstone, which is uh, the last of the um, uh, the strata that you find in the Armadeus Basin stratigraphy. It begins with the heavy tree quartz site uh, nearly a billion years ago, and it ends um, with the Hermansburg sandstone. What you see there is is basically the product of those. Um, uh, Western McDonnell Ranges uh, being pushed up um, quite dramatically and then um, uh, creating huge amounts of sediment. So that's the origin of um, the Hermansburg sandstone is the McDonnell Ranges themselves. And a little bit after that, you've got the Brill uh, conglomerate, which is uh, part of that um, story, the, um, the, the, the end of the Armadeus Basin stratigraphy and, uh, and what you see around uh, in Central Australia in terms of the geology, the layers of geology that um, uh, are around there. And uh, it is just gorgeous, velvety red um, uh, sandstone you have, and you can see that um, it has lots of interesting structures inside it uh, as well. And uh, this is just a, a tributary into the into the Fink River that um, flows out to eventually down to, to Lake Eyre. So uh, an extraordinary place. I still remember um, actually when we were walking through and there was a little um, uh, military dragon that jumped up on my boot and was um, basically using my boot as a, as a platform to uh, um, catch flies. Yeah. Um, and I think you got some really good footage of that. Um, I and did. we were intrigued by this bold little um, dragon who actually um, saw me as a, uh, as a convenient platform and and I think it felt like he was asking me to stay there for a while so he can catch all the flies that I was attracting through the sweat that I was uh, pouring off me and uh, um, he was just having a feast. Yeah, that was an amazing day. That was an amazing yeah. day. Um, 
if we move on to the next slide, another expression. Uh, you can see the stromatolites. Of course, we've we've spoken about this, haven't we? We have, yeah, the stromatolites. Um, and I see a stromatolite, I take off my hat and I say thank you very much for the air I breathe. And it's the, what we're seeing here is, is a still image of drone footage of Ellery Creek Big Hole, the stromatolites above. Of course, we thank them for the air, the blue skies. And so it was fitting that we put them in the sky in this image. So there's lots of obviously these kinds of details and, and references to the shaping of our world. In this next one, we can see three, we can see Goss's Bluff, we can see Stanley Chasm. And the next one along is actually a stromatolite fossil that Adam Yates showed me from, uh, from Central Australian Museum. It's on display there. Uh, and there's also a lot of little paleo maps in there and some of Marley's illustrations. And now we can see a very different image of uh, Goss's Bluff again. It's an image from a plane, and I put in a uh, very comical uh, and not accurate <laughs> comet, uh, but a just a reference point to the, the deep time unfolding of the world in this region. Uh, the next one, now we're moving into a sequence of uh, map images. Uh, that we can see uh, that Marley has rendered. Okay, so what we're seeing there, this is um, a map of um, the region to the west and southwest of Alice Springs um, and uh, the various ways to get out to the McDonald Ranges. Um, so uh, looking at Alice Springs itself, if you move to the left um, and head out west, this is the Lara Pinta Drive that goes out and explores and uh, weaves through the uh, different um, uh, ancient landscapes, mountainous landscapes of the West McDonald Ranges um, and all the way out to, to Mount Zeal where uh, the Fink River is Ellery, um, uh, Ellery Creek, big hole you've passed at Mount Sonda and continue on that road you'll head out to um, uh, to Nurala, to Goss's Bluff. But if you go back a little bit, um, uh, you'll see there's a, a road that um, sort of veers off um, in a south direction, but also heads west, um, and that skirts out past um, uh, Namajira. You can see Namajira, which is basically the um, um, the regional name around Hermansburg, the beautiful old uh, township of Hermansburg um, in western Arunda country. And it's just south of... Uh, Hermansburg, where you'll find uh, um, Palm Valley and the uh, Fink Gorge National Park. Uh, this is where the Fink River, or the Lara Pinta, flows from the north around Mount Sonda and uh, across the um, plain, missionary plain, uh, through um, Hermansburg and then uh, and where the Palm Valley, the creek come from Palm Valley, flows into the Fink River and then eventually down through the Hermansburg sandstone area and Fink Gorge National Park and uh, flows out to, towards the west. So a lot of, um, uh, in short, basically, um, this whole landscape is, is all about um, uh, the Western McDonald Ranges, the Amadeus uh, Basin stratigraphy, all the layers between uh, the Rodinia supercontinent and Pangaea, but also the Fink River as well. So those are the elements um, that have formed this landscape uh, of the map that we're looking at at the moment. Uh, um, so two supercontinents, cycles, uh, uh, and, a, and, a, and a river and everything that's happened in between. So it is quite a, um, it's like a, a museum of what happens um, between two supercontinent cycles um, and, and the, the, the incredible features that they create and and particularly the um the river that cuts through all of this it um is it, it disregards the topography um and basically like a laser cuts through this landscape um um uh, in some cases right across the the rock strata some of this sun um, rock is incredibly resistant but it tells you uh, the power of water and time um and that um it cuts through this this ancient landscape so um you, when I look at this, I, my mind just it becomes incredibly busy because I can actually see overlay that with multiple stories that go across this incredible landscape, um, uh, the stories um, told uh, 
uh, over eons by the, the Western Narendra people. Incredible, incredible. Yes, and in, in, within the sequence of maps, that certainly is one of the, the, the deep, deep time ones. But moving on to the next one, we have something in, a, in one sense, in a much shorter time frame, that is a reliquary of uh, many deep, deep, deep gene stream lineages. And that's the uh, Botanic Garden that you, you have at Alice Springs. Yes, that's it. Uh, um, the Olive Pink Botanic Garden is um, one of the uh, uh, gems of Alice Springs. And uh, whilst we've got um, Alice Springs Desert Park, which showcases um, our, our birds and animals, reptiles, and uh, to some degree uh, a botanic collection, uh, the Olive Pink Botanic Garden is definitely worth um, uh, visiting itself. It's embedded in a, also a very ancient landscape, embedded and uh, in incredible um, cultural story right across um, uh, the actual park and the, the site itself. But um, the, the collection there is uh, just a testimony of the, the people who work there and carry on the, the incredible work of Olive Pink. Olive Pink herself is probably one of the most renowned, most uh, incredible field naturalists. Uh, um, her drawings um, of, of the plants that she so uh, loved and, and was intrigued by is, is legendary. Uh, um, and many people who remember her and had conversations with her, like Dikemba, uh, were enamoured by her, her absolute um, uh, love for, for, for country and for the Aranda people. And, and has made Alice Springs such a special place. I actually remember back in 2011, Marley, um, I was staying with Marley because I've known Marley for a long time. And um, she uh, was asked to go and do a workshop out at Alice Springs at um, Olive Pink. And I'd never been there. And so I ended up um, staying at her place in Melbourne and she went out to Olive Pink and Alice Springs. I was thinking, oh, geez, I want to go out to Alice Springs. It must be amazing out there. And so, you know, there's connections going back there a, a, a long time. We never imagined that way later on we'd be doing this artwork, or, you know, uh, talking with someone like you, so knowledgeable about all of this. It's, it's quite amazing, really, how it all unfolds. But if we move on to the next slide, this is, again, a, a render provided by Marley. Uh, and then embedded into the image. Again, you know, it, it's pretty much what we were talking about before, but you can see a little bit more in this image than the previous one. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, as an extension of the, the previous image, uh, um, looking at the maps there, you've got a, a much um, wider appreciation looking towards the south, southwest of Alice Springs out as far as Kings Canyon, and you've got the, the Marini Loop there, the um, the road, uh, the dirt road that goes out um, west past um, Norola and all the way out west, sort of magical uh, landscape. Again, um, every hill has a, has a name and a story um, heading out that way, uh, not just um, the names given by the explorers, but in fact it's actually more densely named uh, by the tens of thousands of years that uh, the uh, Western Islander people and the Loricha people um, uh, have spent time out there naming and understanding intimately well their country. Um, and then it goes through that incredible landscape uh, out towards Kings Canyon. That's where you see the uh, um, uh, the Marini sandstone um, and the incredible um, ranges, the uh, uh, George Gill Range, which is where um, Kings, Band, uh, Kings Canyon is embedded. Uh, um, and it's a very different landscape um, uh, out around Kings Canyon than um, the West McDonald Ranges, just as um, uh, enchanting um, and intriguing, just in a, in a very different way. And, and that sort of gives you um, sort of a spatial awareness of, of, um, of what you can see in Alice Springs. It's uh, not just Alice Springs, but the, the surrounding area, particularly west and south west of um, Alice Springs and even not far away you've got uh, the Owen Springs Reserve which is kind of like a, uh, a miniature world of what you would see out along the, the James Range. This is where the uh, 
the Hugh River flows through and creates Lawrence Gorge and some really beautiful walking, camping around their great um, area to do, um, you know, nature journaling not far from Alice Springs. It's just a day trip out. Um, um, out from Alice Springs, you can go early morning and spend most of the day there and then come back into Alice Springs. That's a, a very comfortable day trip as well. And just um, west of there, you've got Wallace Rock Hole, which is... Um, uh, we're just incredible um, township there uh, with some fascinating people and the rock hole itself has um, some incredible um, uh, rock art through there and again is sort of just saturated with um, multiple stories that come through and, and um, uh, this is this is a great um, uh, sort of appreciation of what you can see um, west and southwest of Alice Springs and I love the image of the Major Mitchell Cockatoo which you'll see in abundance um, all the way um, uh, around this particular region, particularly in association with the uh, the desert oaks that you find uh, in abundance just around Kings Canyon and I can see Huss's Bluff um, uh, out there which is also just a really beautiful um, area and also just uh, is just ancient um, and uh, has its own credible stories but you're, you're uh, you're looking at at least a couple of days um, uh, when you head out to Arthur's Bluff and uh, that area there. So yeah, and the next and the next one shows us a little moves a little bit to the the east. The next one um, we've got um, we can see Chambers Pillar, and we can also see something I don't think I've went to Santa Teresa. You, you would have gone out that way, Haley, in Santa Teresa, I think. In the yeah. next slide. You, you've obviously pretty much been everywhere. I mean, yeah, that's it. I mean, um, or the, out east, um, east of Alice Springs and southeast. This is um, kind of the fringe of the uh, the Simpson Desert, uh, Chichicala, or um, Fink, uh, a little bit further, or just north of Chambers Pillar. This is um, the sand dune country uh, um, to the southeast of Alice Springs, uh, where uh, the sand's all been basically excavated and brought down from the McDonald Ranges and um, strewn across the uh, uh, the edge of the Simpson Desert. And this is uh, this whole part is uh, all formed by uh, the the Fink River. You can see just the the, the outline of the squiggle of the Fink River sort of flowing out towards the southeast and eventually into Lake Eyre. But Santa Teresa is um probably one of the most enchanting um, townships of uh, or east of um, Alice Springs and again is just surrounded by remarkable, remarkable, mind-blowing um, uh, geology. I, I do remember actually um, uh, doing a... Um, uh, a geology lesson to the um, to the students out at Santa Teresa, um, and explaining sort of very very simply how the geology of their surrounding area was formed by simply just um, uh, having layers of, of clay um, successively put on top of each other. Um, you got purple, then orange, then green, then blue, then then yellow, and then. Um, uh, pressing it over a big boulder um, and to depict um, sort of uplift and um, the, def um, the deformation of these layers and then taking it off and then cutting through the um, uh, the, the layers of plasticine um, and then um, showing all the different shapes and then doing a slight twist um, in it and, uh, and pretty much in the matter of like 10 minutes we were able to um, create the exact aerial photo around Santa Teresa with the plasticine that we had created and they got it they understood exactly how um, uh, the, the the rocks and the the the, the incredible gnarly geology around Santa Teresa was was formed and and you think well you know there's parallels between the um, the stories that you have out here and what we've just done um, uh, to create what we can see today so uh, it's probably one of the most striking areas um, of uh, nearby Alice Springs lesser known lesser traveled but uh, just as magical yeah I actually do think I did go out there with the geologist it was sh sh shocking yeah you know it, folds on folds on folds and it's like oh my god it was yeah. just just keep just keeps coming at you um it, it does. Uh, it does. that's like i think um, and it's probably one of the best examples that uh, um of when you look at it uh, it's like i can see how um uh 
geology and understanding it through big time rocks become fluid fluidized and then mm. you look at it and you think there's seriously something that's gone on happening here and it's incredible and it's powerful i had actually you turn you're talking about the demonstration you've done with the kids once i i did something similar but different i, I had all these little dinosaurs from your cretaceous jurassic and triassic and I embedded them in layers of jelly. So you put down your Triassic first, then you and then you you did your jelly, put in your little dinosaurs in the next layer, let that set, and then you build up the next layer a different colour for your Jurassic and put in your dinosaurs. And so we all had dessert and we got to excavate through deep time digging up the dinosaurs in the jelly. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, that was sounds, a lot of fun. Sounds like a great way to uh, um, initiate the young into into geology and field geology in particular. Uh, um, so, yeah, it is. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, you, you get to taste deep time and taste the sensation of intrigue and, and wonderment and, and curiosity. And the different flavours. That's it. Yeah, they, uh, there's a, a definitive difference um, between them, that's for sure. Yeah. Moving on to the next one, that's just a close-up of uh, what we previously discussed, um, just to the, the west. I, I don't know if you'd want to talk about that or we just move on further. Well, yeah, just uh, looking at that one, I, I've uh, see, spotted uh, um, uh, Serpentine Gorge, uh, um, uh, which is also uh, one of the... the um, Gems of the Western McDonald Ranges, uh, um, uh, all the other the gorges, uh, Ellery Creek, um, Glen Helen, uh, Ormiston Gorge, they're, they're incredible. But certainly, um, um, if you're heading out that way, make time to get into Serpentine Gorge. It is uh, it is a real sanctuary for incredibly rare plants, bird life. It's probably one of the best places for birding as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, I've seen that and I just, my mind just gets blown away by the time that I've, uh, with the time that I've spent there. It is uh, just one of those other incredible places in the Western McDonald Ranges that, that, that deserves time. Yeah, and a lot of the places do, that's for sure. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the next one. Yes, wow. Okay, looking at... Uh, um, so when we're looking at this, um, uh, the Red Bank Shear Zone, uh, that is um, what has really uh, um, turned the geology around uh, um, west of Alice Springs um, on its on its head. Really, yeah, um, it is uh, made reference to sort of kneading a dough and turning it upside down. This is what the Red Bank Shear Zone is all about. It's um, uh, the compression. Um, the forces that created um, this particular area of the West McDonald Ranges and, and largely uh, the McDonald Ranges um, uh, is probably best uh, um, sort of defined at the Red Bank Shear Zone. Um, uh, essentially, you're looking at um, um, you know 20 kilometres of compression uh, um, uh, into just a small um, space. So, if you're going to imagine like a blanket. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, that's let's say two meters. Two meters represents twenty kilometers, and you just compress it um, from one end, and you get these all these folds coming over, um, and that's uh, what you get is this, this long lines of lines of folds and um, and uh, shears shear zones, bolts, um, and uh, eventually something's got to break, and then you get a shear zone, and then it basically uh, um, uh, is going to be turned upside down eventually and that's essentially what you see in Mount Sonder around Ormson Gorge, that area there. And then you've got um, uh, um, numbers that refer to um, uh, uh, Nuna, the uh, supercontinent cycle uh, before Pangaea, before Rodinia, you've got um, Nuna and uh, a lot of the um, geology that you find um, north of um, the Western McDonald Ranges was formed um, during the time of Nuna, uh, particularly like the the, the Chewings um, Range quartz site that you find around uh, Stanley Chasm. That that was basically uh, placed and um, uh, began around the end of Nuna about 1.7 billion years ago um, as a result of those mountains being formed and sort of um, sort of uh, accreted from the north. Um, 
to to the south. So it started up in the north around Darwin and was accreted over time uh, um, progressively as it um, uh, heads south. And uh, um, at the same time, just off to the east, you you had um, uh, the southwest of the United States. And this is one of the other fun facts. When you go through deep time, um, uh, we we were entwined, embedded with the United States in Nuna, like we we have been uh, with Antarctica just recently coming out of Pangaea, Australia's um, uh, its brethren with um, with Antarctica, similar to um, the southwest part of the United States, is one of the fun facts when I talk about um, deep time with um, people from the United States um, and saying, well, you know, we go back three supercontinent cycles, uh, Australia and the United States were, were, were together shoulder on shoulder um, forming pretty much at the same time. And that's this is this is what we're looking at. Um, um, it's basically a very simplified um, uh, um, geological map of of the the um, end of um, Nuna, and when Australia was pretty much upside down, um, up in the northern hemisphere, and um, uh, shoulder to shoulder with um, Northwest uh, United States. Yeah, that's incredible, isn't it? To think that America and Australia shared a kinship which has gone on for a longer bracket of time, continued on for a longer bracket of time than the actual connection between Central Australia and, of course, the the eastern uh, coast of Australia, eastern side of Australia as we understand it today. Exactly, yeah. The the east coast of Australia is just a, a recent newcomer, really. Amazing stuff. Moving along, incredible journeys through deep time that we're taking here. Yeah, I mean, the Armadais Basin is um, what makes up um, the vast region around uh, Alice Springs, particularly to the to the south uh, southwest. Uh, it is the result of a uh, the the stretching of Australia um, coming on about eight hundred million years ago. This is um, uh, essentially the setting. Um, for the Ahmed Bay's Basin stratigraphy, all the different rock layers that we find throughout um, uh, Central Australia um, uh, has occurred basically because of the basin. It's like a, um, if you can imagine, um, again, going back to Plasticine and then you stretch it out and then it basically dips down, you've got a very shallow dish that is essentially uh, the Armadais Basin and that's the, the precursor, the, uh, an absolute prerequisite um, for any layers, successive layers coming in. You need a depression to occur first and then you get the layers that, um, um, uh, that form above it. Without that initial stretching 800 million years ago, uh, um, essentially when um, Australia and the United States started um, having spent you know a long time to Together and started moving apart um, um, and breaking up. Um, you had the the formation of the Armadais Basin, and this is basically um, uh, the beginning of the Armadais Basin. It was essentially the end of Rodinia, and when we started saying goodbye to the United States, it started drifting off in a, in a different direction. And in doing that, it, it, it left a, a final sort of parting present, and that was the Armadais Basin. And it began with the heavy tree uh, quartz that we see today and it finished with the, um, the Brewer conglomerate that we see sort of around uh, um, the Neural Art Gosses Bluff area. So um, the Armadais Basin basically um, uh, is home to 650 million years of, of, of geology. It basically uh, tells the story of what happens between um, supercontinent cycles, between Rodinia and Pangaea. So uh, it is incredibly important. Then you've got these other basins that have occurred since um, um, the Armadais Basin surrounding it as a result of the, of the uh, uh, tectonic push me pull um, uh, dodge em car behaviour of, of the of Earth's tectonic plates and they created these other um, smaller basins around which uh, have their own particular geology. So the Armadais Basin is, is incredible and you see a sense of that just um, uh, east of Uluru, just east of uh, Curtin Springs that it dips down um, and you can see the, the salt flats um, north and south of the of the of the Lassiter Highway, and that, and you can see that, that this is essentially 
uh, something incredibly ancient. Um, uh, Pandu or the uh, Amadeus Lake system is, is a relic of that. Absolutely incredible. Okay, so in this next slide, we can see uh, an image of the southern continents in their arrangement during the time of Gondwana. And so that's in the red. You can see the continents highlighted in the red, Antarctica, in somewhat central, and this is the darker red. And uh, then we have a, a drawing of a, a tree that is um, actually from the Dane tree, uh, I believe from memory. But what I was doing there was referencing the richness of the uh, ecology of Gondwanan times. Could you say something about that, Ben? I mean, the, the, the diversity of the, the types of um, ecology that has been in Central Australia at, at different times is it couldn't be more diverse, really, could it? Yeah, uh, yeah this is one of the things that uh, um, uh, is striking around um, Central Australia, around Alice Springs, through the McDonald Ranges, and probably most vividly um, in the, the gaps and gorges um, of the West McDonald Ranges. Um, the, the, the ferns, for example, the cycads, uh, um, uh, the, the presence of um, palms through uh, Fink Gorge, or basically uh, tell you the story that um, uh, it, it was a much wetter um, environment uh, millions of years ago, and the, these um, um, gaps and gorges are uh, refugees. Uh, basically like um, a, a museum of old and new, really, the whole area. Um, and uh, when you go back, you can see, when you go across the plains, you can see the desert environments, but then you go into these cool sanctuaries. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's an experience because you're stepping back in time and you're getting to see these living um, fossils um, uh, still uh, persevering, still surviving, still in a way thriving um, and still very much a part of the um, the landscapes. So uh, it gives you, it's like, well, what, what is this tropical plant doing here in the middle of the desert? But the fact is that it hasn't always been a desert. Um, it was a, a much uh, wetter, um, more climate um, environment um, and that um, uh, offered a huge amount of um, uh, life throughout that area uh, in a very different um, way than what we see today. So um, it, it's a palimpsest, if you like, um, uh, of the different um, uh, life uh, that we've had over the last 15, 30, maybe 30 million years is probably um, the best um, uh, unit of measure there. Uh, so, so the aridity of Central Australia comparable to other things is quite recent in its history. But let's move on to uh, this big picture map. You can see Alice Springs and we can see to the east, to the west here. It's uh, so much of what we've discussed is, is encapsulated within this map, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. So when you when you say Alice Springs, uh, it's not just the township of Alice Springs, but there's many different um, places around Alice Springs that you can go to, which you can clearly see. Uh, east and west of Alice Springs, you've got the McDonald Ranges, but also just um, to the southwest, uh, you have Palm Valley, Fink Gorge, um, and then just very close by to Alice Springs, you've got the Owen Springs Reserve, Rainbow Valley. These uh, places are extraordinary and uh, you can spend a great deal of time out there. And then out to the uh, to the east, you can go out as far um, to Ruby Gap. If you've got a four-wheel drive, Trofina Gorge, even if you've just got a um, two-wheel drive, that's enough. Um, and uh, so, and even further afield, uh, um, um, a couple of days out to Kings Canyon um, and uh, uh, further down south on the way to um, Uluru, you can drop in and see the uh, Hembury uh, Meteorite Conservation uh, Reserve there where you uh, can see the remnants, uh, crater remnants of uh, a meteorite that came in over maybe 4,000 years ago. And, of course, all the way down to um, uh, Yalara and uh, Uluru for Katajuta. Um, so the, the place is just um, full of different places um, 
and uh, an opportunity sort of to sort of travel not across um, the uh, Central Australia and the outback there, but uh, into and uh, back into into deep time. So it's basically you're looking at a map of of all the different interesting points back through deep time, if you like. Yeah, stunning, stunning stuff, and it it truly is uh, a place like no other. The wonderment of it. Uh, moving into this next map. So what we're looking here is at uh, the map of just north of Alice Springs around the Alice Springs Telegraph Station uh, and it depicts some um, uh, multiple walks that you can do uh, around the Telegraph Station and the Telegraph Station in itself um, is incredibly interesting and in making up part of uh, one of numerous Telegraph Stations from the north to the south from Darwin down to Adelaide uh, um, that uh, provided the, the communication uh, vital for Australia with um, with England right across the world. So Alice Springs Telegraph Station was a key component to that. But from there, you can actually go um, uh, mostly up into the north, north of uh, the station through multiple walks and also bike trails um, through some really fascinating um, landscape, uh, really ancient again, um, all the way up to Wiggly uh, waterhole and the gorge and looping back around um, and through that landscape you'll see uh, kangaroos and of course the um, uh, hill kangaroos the euros um, and that's essentially the the start point of the the Lara Pinta trail that goes all the way uh, westward uh, up to Mount Sonder some two hundred and twenty three kilometres that's the that's the section the first section of that and and that in itself is quite a, a magical. Um, first section out west um, so uh, uh, definitely worth uh, um, uh, going to visit and explore just for all of those reasons really so moving on to the next one we can see up the top we can see simpson's gap uh, what can you tell us about this map oh this yeah this map basically depicts all the multiple trails that you have around uh, simpson's gap just going south along uh, road creek uh, it's also part of the, the Lara Pinta Trail um, and also um, it's part of a, um, a bike path that goes from Alice Springs all the way out to uh, Simpsons Gap. It's incredibly popular for the locals to go riding out through their beautiful range out as far as the, the Gap itself. Um, but all that area there um, is gives you an insight into the kind of um, uh, dry river uh, bed landscape that you find the woodlands uh, that you find around uh, um, the ranges in particular and of course um, you'll see lots of uh, beautiful ghost gums uh, spinifex and other eucalyptus trees including the the river red gum uh, particularly around the, the gap at sea these beautiful old um, river red gums uh, that um, thrive along the the creeks and rivers and water holes of uh, Central Australia, including that um, beautiful uh, woodland trail that goes along Rocky Creek, um, you can get an appreciation of the uh, incredible geology that we have around there. It's all in that um, ancient um, geological area. We're basically looking at um, uh, the area of the Saturdine uh, Nice, which is about 1.6 billion years old. So, yeah, not far from Alice Springs, certainly worth um, uh, exploring. And then just south of that, you've got... Um, uh, um, honeymoon Gap, which is uh, a beautiful part of um, the of uh, west of Alice Springs as well, and takes you around through um, the Papa uh, and out towards the airport. So it's a beautiful little circuit that you can do out there as well. It is incredible, truly. And one of the things that I, I wanted to incorporate into the artwork was actual satellite imagery, just softly embedded into amongst all of the, the drawing features and so in this first image that we can see could you tell us what we're looking at here oh so yes um uh, boggy waterhole um one of my favorite places in uh the um well it's actually south of uh, the western mcdonald ranges but this is um that that line that you can see through there is in fact the lara pinta the fink river just south of uh fink uh, Gorge National Park, um, Boggy Waterhole is um, where the Fink River basically cuts through the the geology there and slows down and deepens, and so there's um, a real um, uh, beautiful uh, 
water hole landscape around there, lots of reeds, lots of um, trees, um, and because it's um, sitting between or in the gap and it's uh, east or west, there's long periods of um, of shadows, particularly in the early morning and uh, uh, the late afternoon, and you see an abundance of um, of wildlife around here. So, one of the most um, popular camping spots there. You certainly need a, a four wheel drive to get out to uh, uh, Boggy Waterhole, and then the the four wheel drive track basically follows along the Fink River and down south, um, and connects eventually to um, uh, the Kings Canyon. So, uh, again. It just goes through some spectacular landscape uh, um, and some really beautiful camp. You can spend days uh, just sitting around a boggy waterhole. Yeah, it, it is extraordinary how the, the water just is, it cuts through these, these ancient, ancient rock formations. Yeah, so this, it's a big river. It's just like a, um, uh, a knife through... Um, warm butter it just cuts through it just needs time needs water um, and uh, it just maintains its course as it slowly uh, um, cuts its way through the range and excavates all the material all the um, when you look at the McDonald ranges and you think oh man that's incredible um, but one of the first things that I think of is like where did all the material go uh, I'm, I'm only just seeing a fraction of what used to be there Where where's where's it all gone and it's somewhere down in South Australia around Lake Care and explains why it's so flat and salty um, um, out that way and uh, it, uh, it, the mountain has gone it's down somewhere in South Australia really Wow Wow. In the next image, we can see Glen Helen Gorge. Uh, that's just a striking satellite image, that one, isn't it? There's Mount Sonda, Ormiston Gorge, Ormiston Pound. Yes, that's it. So, again, um, the Fink River does what it does best, and it, um, uh, it, it has no regard for... Uh, the resistance of, of rocks and geology, uh, again, just um, over a vast amount of time with water, uh, you can do anything. You can cut through mountains. Just ask the, uh, the Lara Pinta Fink River and you can see on this um, uh, satellite map what it does. It, uh, it rises up and around uh, Mount Sonda, Ormiston Pound. Ormiston Pound itself is, is quite extraordinary as well, um, just to... Um, be inside it and watch um, or just observe the um, the, the quartz site um, uh, capped ranges around it and uh, and you can see um, where uh, the catchment area comes from that feeds into the, the Fink River and it comes down and uh, basically casually cuts through this incredible geology that cuts through about um, about two to 200 uh, million years of geology there um, from Glen Hill and Gorge, and uh, as you can see those layers, and it just cuts all the way through, and then it comes out into uh, uh, Missionary Plain and heads out towards Hermansburg um, and gathers even more volume um, from the plain itself um, and creates um, great um, uh, habitat around Hermansburg and uh, steady uh, supply of water and then starts to cut through the James Range like it did pretty much just south of uh, Glen Hill and Gorge. Stunning. There's certainly this interplay between the subtleties of the landscape and the intensity of the stories and, uh, of course, the, the heat at times as well. The expressions of life are so diverse and the expressions in which you can reflect on deep time also very diverse. In this next image, it's, it's very, very subtle. You can see a sequence of paleo maps. So we're traversing hundreds of millions of years there and in the center that's a that's a satellite image looking down on mount gill and, and it's just there that uh, very close to where alice springs desert park is where we met that's it um, mount Gillen is um uh, a prominent feature of Alice Springs, just west of Alice Springs. Um, and yes, very easily seen from Alice Springs Desert Park. It's one of the, the icons of Alice Springs Desert Park. It's, uh, it's one of the things that you see when you come in. And as you sort of move around Alice Springs Desert Park, you can always use that as a a point of reference um, uh, as you sort of move around and it's a constant reminder of the kind of landscape that you're in and the diversity of the landscape that you have. You've got, to, of course, um, 
uh, the uh, the dry river beds, the woodlands, the sand country, um, uh, the mulga woodlands. Um, there's such a diversity of landscapes. Um, just in that area around Alice Springs, there's a park, and just below uh, Mount uh, Mount Gillen, and Mount Gillen itself is is capped by the uh, heavy tree quartzite, the first of many. Um, uh, rock layers that make up um, what will you see around uh, Central Australia in the vicinity of um, Alice Springs. So it's one of my favourite um, sites to behold, uh, something that I look forward to seeing whenever I go back to Alice Springs. Yeah, yeah, it was truly an extraordinary experience being able to live there for several months. Uh, nothing really like it. And, but the, I remember the sand country, seeing, seeing the sand country before actually going out there, if we look at the next slide along, you were talking before about, well, that the mountains, it's, it's, it's moved, you know, a large amount of it is, is south. And you can, you can see the Simpson Desert here and you can see Lake Eyre. So, so what you, you're saying, Ben, is that material that was once up in those mountains, that, you know, we've, we've heard uh, some references talking about perhaps the height of the Rocky Mountains, in the, which is in McDonald Ranges is that some of that material of course it's gone off in all sorts of different directions but some of it's down at lake air now and um simpson desert yeah absolutely so the the material uh, um that um presently uh, coming out of the mcdonald ranges i mean the mcdonald ranges is, is all is also still undergoing erosion um, and of course you've got the sedimentation that comes from the um, mcdonald ranges flows um down uh, the Chew River, the Fink River, the Todd River, and they all end up in the in the uh, the north west of the Simpson Desert. So the Simpson Desert, uh, um, by and large, is made up of sediments that um, have come from the McDonald Ranges, uh, um, and 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 basically uh, um, sort of encompasses. Um, the uh, the Arundel language. So if you have a look at the, the Aboriginal map of Australia, and you'll see this sort of uh, triangle shape um, that depicts where Arundel is spoken. That's eastern, central, western Arundel, southern Arundel, and it, it basically its northern border is the McDonald Ranges, and the languages basically um, move along um, uh, roughly along the. Um, uh, the the course of the Fink River, the Hugh River, and the, and the Todd River going out, um, and it's no surprise that that language basically encompasses that area and, and moves in a south, south, southerly direction, pretty much like the sediments that, that come out of the McDonald Ranges. Um, and so, yes, uh, um, the Simpson Desert is is largely made um, uh, by and from uh, the McDonald Ranges, and and kind of gives you a sense of um, well, you know, maybe another. 300 million years time uh, when a geologist goes through and has a look at the, uh, uh, the, 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 the rock layer, the sandstone um, that used to be the Simpson Desert and, and would be looking at it and going, I wonder where that came from and, uh, and would probably uh, be able to unpick that uh, there was a, a mighty mountain range um, uh, that produced these vast amounts of sediments that make up the Simpson Desert and uh, yeah, anything that is south of um, uh, the McDonald Ranges um, is probably from the McDonald Ranges. In um, relation to what seems to be another subject, but it's actually not. It's, it's everything's connected um, in in reference to these expressions that we have in you know, of landscape. Um, when um, you know white people arrived, there was the the the, the culture of artists that the. The first uh, artists that, that accompanied the early explorers, that the field naturalists artists, and then then you see that the, the Heidelberg School. There was something comparable in America, the Hudson River School, but the Heidelberg School uh, being um, inspired by what was happening with impressionism, but they're really uh, capturing aspects of landscape. And then you have a group after that, the Angry Penguins. That we're doing something different again and to my mind they're what was was missing for these white people that had arrived these bleached africans from the north uh was this absence of uh some kind of mythology and so the, the angry penguins fulfilled that to a degree and um i, I remember looking although they they weren't 
necessarily there with the Angry Penguins to a degree they were. I'm talking about the artists John Olson and Brett Whiteley, and I'd see their their rivers and things, and I'd see, wow, that's so abstract. And for years and years, when I was, I was young, I'd think, wow, well, imagine doing those lines. And then I realised that they weren't making them up. Uh, you know, I did a residency um, with Wright's Air um, at Lake Air, flying over Lake Air. I got to do that a couple of times um, every day um, for a few weeks, and, and that had a huge impact on me, and I realised that there's so many expressions of line uh, that, that you think, oh, off in the realms of abstract art, but it, it wasn't at all. It was absolutely true that the, the, the water channels had carved out these expressions because my kind of mission statement at the beginning of the, all these residencies was to initially uh, look at the landscapes uh, that the angry penguins had worked in but come at it from a field naturalist point of view. Uh, they were mainly working on, on the, in the east, of course, uh, with a few exceptions. Uh, but then that that really expanded into you know what we're talking about today. But that line work, uh, you know, you take a second look at, at um, Brett Whiteley's and John Olson's line work. Go fly in a plane over some of the central Australian areas, uh, such as the Fink River, and the Fink is 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 bang on. The line work is there. Those those expressions uh, are not uh, abstract. They are real accurate depictions of what water does when it flows through these arid environments that are full of these vestiges of, of deep time rock formations. Uh, it, it, it's, it's amazing, the interplay between art and life, I guess you would say. Yeah. I suppose so when, from my point of view, I, I look at um, when I'm sort of on Google Earth or looking at um, satellite maps of Central Australia, of which I've done quite a lot of um, in my sort of understanding and appreciation of Central Australia. And um, uh, I came across um, a number of years ago this uh, expression or this phrase or, or actual word called palimpsest, which refers to a manuscript that has been um, uh, used and reused and washed off. It's like um, uh, uh, similar to when a kid has run out of paper and has done a drawing and then he rubs everything off, but you can't um, write, rub off everything there you can still see the impressions um, of the previous work and then he overlays that with uh, another piece of work, um, uh, like a, an old reused parchment. So this is kind of what um, I see when I look at um, um, the, the lines, the, um, uh, the subtleties, things that you could very, very easily miss um, from a satellite um, uh, photo when you're looking at it um, is like a, a palimpsest uh, effect. You've had one artist or one uh, scribe coming in and um, uh, doing his work and then um, and because there's limited space, there's limited parchments and then uh, that gets used and then uh, then it gets all rubbed out and then you get the, another artist who comes in with his own ideas about how things should be and uh, um, and the, the picks that and then um, uh, then that gets rubbed out and then you have another uh, artist. So you can sec uh, consecutive artists with their different ideas uh, going in, um, making an effort to rub out what was previously there but not can't get rid of everything uh, and then uh, and eventually you get this sort of what actually inadvertently turns out to be a piece of artwork uh, um, uh, of these different ideas coming in being uh, erased and overlaid and then you you've got the uh, the vestiges of old artwork they're still there you can't get rid of it um it's going to be there and then and somehow you as you know as an artist you kind of go well i'm going to have to accept what's there and, and try and work in with it uh, um, and essentially in the end you're, you're looking at um, uh, a landscape, a satellite uh, of a landscape that is similar uh, to a palimpsest. Yeah, I remember um, on the Birkenwells Environmental Expedition in 2010, one of the scientists showing me uh, a map that they had one of the river channels, but what they'd also done was plotted out all of the paleo river channels of that river, you know, and yep. there was tons of them. The expressions yep. were incredible. They, you know, you wouldn't be able to, if you were walking through the landscape, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see them. There was the, the Palmer River, actually, um, uh, which is, I think, um, uh, 
uh, a lesser known river of um, uh, Central Australia and that's the one that um, sort of flows out from the south part of um, the James Range and that um, carries that really uh, purpley red um, uh, sand from the Hermansburg. So w when you when you see the Palmer River, you can see um, that the the sediments there are, are, are kind of this beautiful um, reddish colour already. In contrast to the the Fink River, which has a lot of quartz in it and it has a lot of coarse um, sand in it. Uh, and then uh, when the the two rivers meet and their sediments are um, uh, meet, you can see radically yeah, um, uh, that the Palmer River, whilst it's not as voluminous as the, the Fink River, as it's say in terms of the colour of the Fink River um, as it flows, you know, as the flow, Palmer River flows into the Fink River and then the colour changes. So the, 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 the two distinct colours of the Palmer River and the Fink River north of the, the junction uh, uh, sort of tells you about the geology from which those rivers are, um, are flowing from, in particular the Palmer River. I just love the colour every time I, I cross over it um, uh, along the uh, Stewart Highway. I look at it and go, this is just such a beautiful colour and very different from the feet. Yeah, wow. Wow. Yeah, I... I um, it sounds extraordinary. It truly does. Of course, there's many different phases and expressions within the artwork. And if we, you talked about as above, so below, we've, we've dealt muchly with so below. But if we move to as above in the artwork that uh, we can see in this next image, some of the constellations, the different elements, uh, and also, of course, the, the paleo maps. I mean, to be embedded within deep time within the sculpture, that was one of the ideas to, to put the, the deep time plate tectonics of the globe along the top. So in these next slides, do we want to talk about these in detail or will we just move through them and talk yeah. broadly? Okay, so um, uh, so what we're looking at, um, um, uh, some of the constellations that we find, um, very in clear view, uh, from outback Australia, from Alice Springs, um, the skies are incredibly uh, clear, particularly during um, a winter night where the the sky is cold and still, and the seeing is absolutely superb. Uh, um, probably one of the best times to uh, visit Central Australia for the skies is, is during the winter for that particular reason there, but also uh, the fact that you see well, at sunset, you, you get to see a galaxy rise, the Milky Way that comes up um, and uh, basically uh, uh, takes over the entire sky. And you can see many of the uh, iconic um, features in our southern sky uh, in, in, from the outback, unhinged by any mountain ranges or clouds or anything like that. It is um, basically uh, the, your entire realm, two thirds of it is in fact night sky. And again, like the the, uh, the features in the landscape around you, the, the night sky demands your attention and, and uh, it, it is intriguing. And when we look up, we look back and, and immediately get a sense of, of, of um, deep time. But you know, in the context of um, uh, Aboriginal culture, they understood that um, the night sky was an incredibly important place uh, for them to embed their story. They understood that there was a connection between the cosmos and uh, the land, and and so that concept of um, uh, as above, so below. A lot of their stories on the land um, were you know, immersed in, in the sky, weaved into the sky and back down again. So um, the sky and the land were considered pretty much um, one and the same thing, particularly at night time around a campfire where um, it, storytelling was very much a part of the, uh, um, uh, the culture and the lifestyle of the Aboriginal people there. So... Um, it's, I think you've done an incredible job there and understood um, that um, uh, the, the, the landscape, the physical landscape is very much in, um, uh, embedded in the cultural landscape and part of that is, is, is the night sky that you see that and then what you see up there is very much a part of the story of the landscape down below. So you've done an incredible amount of research, Ben. We were looking at connecting the stories of the night sky to the stories of the land. And we feature some of this research that you've done on this page, the Alice Springs page for the, 
the sculpture for Alice Springs. And you also did further research in other projects that we've done, such as Mount Magnet as well. So this is an ongoing theme uh, that we've discussed many times. And if people want to learn more about it, uh, look further down the Alice Springs page. You'll find information there and also other projects such as Mount Magnet. Probably one of the best um, examples of as as above, so below is uh, the Arundel seasonal calendar, which um, uh, is a, a beautiful description about how the seasons unfold. Uh, they uh, identify certain events that's happening in nature and depict um, um, the uh, the passage of time. But probably more accurately, was their um, assessment of the night sky in terms of how that um, was uh, probably one of the most accurate ways to, to mark the passage of time. They understood that um, certain stars and constellations uh, um, at certain positions of the sky would depict um, um, uh, the passage of time and in particular um, uh, the seasons. Probably one of the best examples is when uh, Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, is um, very low over the horizon and shortly about to set after um, sunset, you know that the, you've got the onset of, of, of winter um, and, and other um, examples like that throughout time. So the seasonality, understanding of what's happening in the, of the land was very much um, marked by the, the, the passing of the stars and where in their positions throughout the night sky. So probably one of the best examples of um, as above, so below. Incredible. Incredible. And then within all of this, we have another story we haven't touched on yet is, of course, the story of the megafauna. If we look at this next slide, we can see Megalania, the ancient giant goanna. Uh, if we think of Komodo and the Komodo dragon, um, I believe, like I, I'd heard some theories, it was that this was actually a species that... Um, evolved initially in Australia and then branched off um, through the Ice Age and, and made it up to Komodo and may, may well have uh, undergone some level of dwarfism. I mean, this, this animal is absolutely massive, the Megalania Prisca, and is, you know. It was a terror. It was a terror. It was an ambush hunter. Uh, it would have been extremely... Uh, terrifying to confront anything like that. Um, it, I suppose to some degree explains um, uh, why even today some of the uh, um, you know the larger forms of our um, animals here in Australia, the, the red kangaroos, are still very nervous, uh, even though the Megalania disappeared uh, um, uh, tens of thousands of years ago. But uh, um, the, the the nervousness, um, because it was an incredible um, um, hunter and uh, you know, we may not have these kind of predators today but um, during the time of the megafauna they were they were they must have been absolutely terrifying and incredibly efficient predators as well yes um, and, and it is thought that um, uh, the megalania well the komodo dragon was um, had its origin somewhere here in australia um, and that gives you some sort of idea about um, how effective these would have, these predators were. Think of a Komodo dragon times three um, and you start to uh, appreciate um, the kind of landscape um, it would have been during the time of the megafauna. And of course, um, you know, it came into contact with the indigenous people in the, the early times in which they first arrived. And of course, if I was back then, uh, and what I would be trying to do is, is find its eggs and smash him. <laughs> yes, uh, I'd be so, terrified but... of the thing, and and uh, uh, you know, with with a threat like that around, I mean, you don't realise what what the longer term outcome of, of doing that is. Like, obviously, we've got no proof that that's what happened, but being a human, you would problem solve the issue by trying to deal with the eggs. I guess you can't deal with the beast; it's just extraordinarily powerful. That's it. Yeah, the, the yeah, you can deal with the eggs. Um, humans in the megafauna. That that uh, your your imagination goes wild. But uh, yes, you you'd think that um, that would have been probably one of the strategies of, of um, at least um, uh, minimising the the threat. Yeah. And then moving on, we see in the next slide some sketches of uh, diprotodons, incredible uh, animals. Yep, 
Absolutely, yeah. Um, the slow-moving uh, animals, um, yeah, huge size, something that um, when we see a, a red kangaroo would have been um, dwarfed by the um, by this huge megafauna. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, we we as Australians don't appreciate um, how lucky uh, we are to have this kind of history and. Uh, um, uh, natural history in our landscape um, and, uh, you know, um, to think and imagine what it would have been like um, during the time of the megafauna. And so the next slide along, we're seeing Dromornis, absolutely humongous. It would have been incredible, again, being confronted by something of, of that scale. And you can see the um, film of uh, paleontologist Adam Yates. If you scroll down across this page, you'll see Adam talking about Dromornis, incredible, uh, again, another megafauna specimen. And, and of course, Peter Trussler has done some incredible illustrations of Dromornis. If you look up Peter Trussler, Dromornis, amazing illustrations. Yeah, uh, another scary um, um, animal that um, we would have had during the time of the megafauna is um, along with the uh, marsupial line, uh, I think um, it would have certainly been a... Um, uh, a really challenging place to sort of come in and uh, and sort of explore and uh, get to know as the first um, uh, Australians would have had to sort of deal with and confront um, and work through when they when they came through this landscape and uh, uh, it would have it, I suppose the uh, the source of the incredible stories that they have today uh, um, uh, the characters uh, in their stories uh, Aboriginal stories are in, in are epic and huge and um, thunderous and um, and I would imagine this is probably where the inspiration comes from. Yeah, yeah, the bunyip with the thylacoleo. Um, yep. The the discovery of the thylacoleo again um, at Narrakor Caves is an interesting one. I believe they just saw the thumb sticking up, this big claw thumb. It's yep. like thumbs up, you know, this big claw thumb. Like, what is that? And then they, they pull this thing out and it's like, <laughs> my God, what an animal. Uh, yeah. I don't believe I have it featured in this artwork, but in the next slide, what I do have is a particularly large trilobite, um, which is interesting. Again, something that paleontologist Adam Yates provided. Just the, um, the, the trilobite, um, you, um, you see actually signs of that, um, uh, fossils of that um, actually in the... Um, in the Owen Springs Reserve, not far from uh, uh, Alice Springs itself, um, in the uh, Horn Valley Formation, and even down along the Stuart um, Highway, uh, there's a, an, ex an outcrop of um, Horn Valley Formation where you see um, trilobites. I still remember actually going through a part of the uh, uh, Owen Springs Reserve in the um, uh, in the part of the James Range there, and uh, looking for the fossils um and particular trilobites and then i stopped and i kind of looked around i felt like i was being watched and i was looking around i think oh my god i'm surrounded by fossils of trilobites air everywhere um and uh just being by, blown away by uh the trilobites uh, um so it's so like one of my favorite um creatures i, I seriously in uh, my um dream of dreams i really want a, a pet trilobite in fact i want a whole uh, um, um, a whole herd of them, actually. I think they're, they're adorable creatures. Are, are just so part of me is kind of like, oh man, the Permian. <laughs> just one species or something that they could have let through, and that would have been the trilobites, I reckon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of course, what you're referencing there is the the great dying and the yeah. the terrible, terrible great extinction, the greatest extinction of all time. Uh, the, of, and uh, unfortunately, the trial of bites didn't get through that. Yeah, I just um, love this um, slide of the, uh, the the skull, the uh, this incredible crocodile. Ah, we're talking Baru, about yeah. Baru. Yeah. 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 Amazing, and there's a film of Adam Yates talking about Baru as well. Yes, yeah, I've seen that, and uh, um, Adam Yates is like one of my favourite um, people. Uh, he's just an incredible. Um, uh, He's so enthusiastic and so such a passionate uh, um, exponent for his field and for Central Australia. And uh, um, he's kind of like Mr. Deep Time himself, really. Uh, um, 
uh, he, he is so fortunate that uh, he's, his work is basically embedded in deep time, unearthing these incredible um, uh, stories and uh, and fossils that he has. Uh, um, so yeah, I just my mind is blown away by what he does. Yes, absolutely. Me too. I had a great time with him. And I'd highly recommend that people scroll down and, and have a look at the, the films uh, that we've got here with Adam Yates, Mr. Deep Time. I, I think that's the perfect name for him. Yeah. Yeah. So here we are. So rare, rare diprotodon fossil. Yeah, the diprotodons, they were something else. Amazing animals. Yeah. yeah. And so moving into the end of this, we have... Just a few illustrations and bits and pieces. Anything else in this next slide that you would like to discuss, Ben? Yeah, I love this slide actually, because um, this is kind of like the the, the bookend of um, uh, of the deep time. So we've we've explored uh, um, the the deepest of deep time uh, from Nuna, Rodinia, um, Gowana, Pangaea, and this is um, essentially the uh, where. Uh, Eastern Australia gets um, uh, built and added on to, to what we recognise today. So um, a lot of people in Sydney and Brisbane don't appreciate um, uh, that they're just basically the, um, uh, the, the epilogue of this incredible um, uh, story of the supercontinent cycle and that the east part of Australia is just a, a recent renovation, if you like, um, and this um, slide uh, depicts that. It sure does. It's amazing to see those deep, deep time connections between the Antarctica and Australian story there as well. So one of the best times in Central Australia is after uh, really, really good rains where you've got um, uh, the blossoming, the explosion of flowers right across Central Australia. And one of the best examples um, you can see is the desert flannel flower, which you see in abundance right across it, uh, um, and in particularly um, around sand country. Uh, it's one of the most magical times there. I mean, it's probably comparable to what you would find and encounter in Western Australia, but certainly here in Central Australia, it's a, quite an exuberant and colourful time uh, to, to, to behold and celebrate, not just as a human being, but I mean, all the animals, the, the birds, the bees, they just go absolutely crazy for this um, um, uh, time of, of abundant flowering. Uh, and, and on a yearly basis, so you can see it maybe around winter, um, even if it hasn't rained, it'll certainly make an effort and flower and it's just a great time to be there. It sure is extraordinary place and there we have it we've now bookended we've we've returned to the beginning and that's been uh, a few of of the journeys that you can take uh when you enter the artwork that we're looking at and so thank you so much for all of your inspiration and knowledge and the research and all the journeys that you took and you just when you know the time that i spent with you ben you just unlocked so much uh, that was so inspiring and then uh, I was able to uh, embed into this growing artwork and I, I think you know the sum of the parts really between uh, everybody that's played a role in this has, has been an extraordinary journey for me personally so thank you very very much for all of your time and inspiration. No my pleasure absolutely yeah I've been beaten um, and your your artwork is um uh, does the, the, the place, this extraordinary landscape justice, uh, um, the incredible detail, the interconnectedness of uh, all the different themes that make up uh, uh, Alice Springs and the surrounding area is beautifully depicted here. So well done, you. Oh, well, I couldn't have done it without Marley. It just lifts everything else up to this next level with all of her work and dedication to this journey that uh, we've undertaken in putting all of this together, that's for sure. Yeah, Marley's work is just um, second to none. She's just amazing uh, all with what how, how she sort of understands um, what she's um, capturing and putting on paper. Uh, you could, when she's finished, you think this is, I can't believe this has been put on something that's two-dimensional. It feels three-dimensional. It feels like it's going to just come out from the paper and just um, 
I heard if it's a bird fly away, a flower, you could almost um, put your nose down and smell it. And uh, um, it, it is so uh, incredibly detailed and real. Um, and uh, I, I can only imagine um, how what, what, what connection she has with what she um, depicts uh, through art um, is that she understands it so utterly to be able to, to get it so accurately um, done and beautifully done as well. Yeah, it truly, truly is incredible. And it really brings that uh, immersion of the, the microcosms and macrocosms of landscape not not only in space but also in uh, deep time as well together so it's been an amazing journey and thank you very much for being our a deep time guide into my, the artwork today my pleasure indeed uh, ben, and, and congratulations again thank you so much